Over the last year, I've documented my experience reading for the very first time the incredible story of Berserk. The magnum opus of one late great Kentaro Miura, who tragically passed away in 2021. To kick off this massive video, for those of you that want to read it but would also like to know my spoiler-free thoughts on it first, my one-line review of my experience with this story is as follows. This is quite literally a story that has changed my outlook on life for the better. And before I spend what will no doubt be an ungodly amount of time sharing with you my discovery of that fact, I'd first like to do something a little different for those of you that do not wish to read this story or are on the fence. And so, for the next couple of minutes, I will try to convince you why this is a life-changing story worthy of your time. Why you should read Berserk. Shonen is the most popular genre of manga in Japan and as a result has spawned some of the most popular releases and indeed anime to hit the rest of the world, many of which I've praised and covered on this very channel. Stories that tell a triumphant journey focusing on perseverance, friendship, and a general coming of age. Messages and themes that are important for a younger audience to learn. Stories that Hollywood and the West love to make films about, where our young hero in mind or in body grows from an experience and becomes an adult. Then the credits roll, we leave the theater, change the channel, or we put down that comic thinking, what a terrific story. But this is not the story Berserk tells. There's more to life than just the first 20 years of it, and due to that fact, Berserk asks questions like, what happens when you have trauma? Can you ever truly heal? What happens when your happily ever after never comes? What happens if you find yourself having grown up and you can't remember or understand why you feel like there's something wrong. A moment we can't remember, but when we know is there, because even in our earliest memories, we've walked through life with a limp. Berserk is a story that helped me realize what's important, it helped me realize that I was being selfish, and it helped me become, I think, a better person. In the same way Dragon Ball helped me to learn life lessons as a child, Berserk helped to illuminate what it is an adult should learn on their journey through life. Through showing us the horrors of human nature as well as its beauty, Kentaro Miura alongside the main character Guts shows us where trauma can hide and manifest and where love and life can thrive despite adversity. This is a tale that pushes the boundaries, sets a new standard, and deals with some of the most compelling character writing I've seen committed to the pages of any manga. And so, if there's any story I recommend reading from beginning to where it ultimately leaves off, it's Berserk. I will say, however, something to keep in mind is that this is not a shonen. It's a seinen manga. It's meant for adults, and if you're someone that struggles with excessive violence, assault on females and males alike, as well as depictions of horrifically contorted monsters far beyond what your wildest dreams can conjure, now's your chance to click out. With that out of the way, it's time to finally share with you all my journey through Berserk. この世界には人の運命を司る律少なくとも人は自らの意思さえ自由にはできない The rest of this video will be divided into five segments, with each segment representing my coverage of one of the five main arcs of Berserk. And these five arcs are the Black Swordsman arc, the Golden Age arc, the Conviction arc, the Falcon of the Millennium Empire arc, and finally, the Fantasia arc, where Kentaro Miura last contributed to this incredible story. Within each arc segment, I will be sharing my experience with that arc, my immediate impressions, my review of different choices, and of course, my deconstruction of the story and predictions for the future. In hindsight, I got some things kinda right and most of it totally wrong, so enjoy that. Oh, also, for those of you that have seen some of these review portions already, I should let you know that my editors have added some extra surprises in there to enhance the experience from new edits to full-blown animations to help bring this story to life. Throughout this journey, you'll notice the exact moment Miura figured out what the story was going to be, and of course, the mind-bendingly brilliant artistic evolution of this very series. This is 10 months worth of work, and I hope you all enjoy my entire journey through Berserk. I'm waiting so long. I'm waiting so long. I'm waiting so long. So, with that said, it's time for me to dive into the first page of Berserk. Okay. In storytelling, 
I find few aspects to be more irritating or offensive than when a story is boring. But let me tell you, Berserk is not boring. And while I've never been an individual to be won over by big man swings big sword good, God's to be swinging that sword pretty good. Like I said in the beginning, I had literally zero expectations going into this, but damn, this story from the opening pages right all the way through is balls to the wall, gore, violence, and tragedy. Now, it's clear that this arc is an establishing one in many respects. It flashes from setting to setting, encounter to encounter, until it doesn't, but that's okay because this arc's main objective is to teach us about one character above all others. Guts. But that's not to say that this arc doesn't have some stunning visuals, brilliant narrative choices, and some of the best paneling I've seen from a series in years. But be warned, it gets pretty intense from here on in. I mean, the opening pages alone are crazy. So, like, I'm sitting there holding this leather-bound behemoth of a volume with two hands, by the way, because it's a thick and heavy boy. I open the first page and BAM! This is what I see. Now, I know we're taught in English class to grab our reader's attention in the opening paragraph or as soon as we can, but jeez, I don't think that this is what Mr. Troy was talking about when he said that. And it's not at all how I thought I'd be spending my Saturday, but... The opening chapters primarily concern themselves with establishing the world, the main character's guts, and a smaller supporting character called Puck, who will no doubt play a massive role in the dynamic moving forward, which I am very grateful for, seeing as the closest thing Guts could muster to light-hearted banter would be him clutching someone's light heart in his fist. Now, full disclosure, that actually hasn't happened yet in my read-through, but I would be surprised if it doesn't ever happen given what this introductory portion has shown me thus far. In saying that, the first few chapters did a fantastic job in sucking me into the story, which, given that this material was written in the 80s, gave me tremendous hope for the future of this series. Normally, with more middle-of-the-road serializations from this era, the age of the product is felt. However, a number of properties managed to achieve that timeless feel with their focus and dedication to character and world-building. Thankfully, Berserk does just that. Berserk feels like it could have been written this year in many ways, helped in part by its dedication to the medieval dark fantasy aesthetic coloring the encounters and choices made by characters, from the weaponry, the armor, or even the transportation used. Need to get to the next town faster? Well, you gotta hitch a ride with some randomer on the back of a horse and cart, all hateful eight style. But the crowning jewel of the story for me has to be how it imbues different individuals with their respective characteristics. In other words, I love this story's characterization. Guts is a character that from the moment I saw him filled me with dread. I had the worst feeling in the back of my mind that he would just be another mindless, personalityless, muscle-bound meathead for us the audience to self-insert into. But he's not. In fact, I thought the angle Miura approached the character with felt both appropriate for the time and retroactively worked for my sensibilities today. He very much feels like the stoic action hero appropriate for the time period, but there's a little more under the surface to keep me interested. A tragic backstory were drip-fed over the course of the narrative that I'm sure we'll see more of as time passes by, but what helped me latch onto him the most was how his actions do not match what he says. Just listening to him, you'd swear he's the most heartless man alive, but in reality, he's probably harvested more hearts from the corpses of his victims that- okay, I'm kidding. Jokes aside, what he says versus how he acts colored my impression of him early, which I think is great. From the moment we meet him as he wanders into a seemingly random town, to the hostility he's met with, and ultimately the violence he strikes down onto them. It's almost like he's trying to convince himself that he is a certain way, focused on his mission to achieve his goal, which we still don't know yet at this point. At numerous times in this story early on, he vocally disparages and denigrates those in society that are weak as both pathetic and not worth life, let alone his consideration. Like Puck, an elf-type creature he stumbles across by chance and because of who he is, Gut shows no sympathy or care despite his circumstances, and yet, whenever he seems to encounter someone in need, including Puck, he gets involved more often than he would let you think. And if that were it, I wouldn't have thought to address it. There are lots of characters like that in anime. Vegeta very much is that character right now in Dragon Ball Super, to a much more light-hearted degree, might I add. Someone that doesn't want to show how much he cares and hides it behind a thin facade. But ultimately, when the chips are down, he does help. Every time. But that's not who Guts is. Every time Guts might do something accidentally or overtly righteous, he shows visible frustration with himself, as if he's scolding or trying to suppress who he truly is instead of accepting it. And at this point, we're not really sure why he does this. 
This makes him not only an interesting anti-hero of sorts, but also a character that is defined by his actions and by what he says, with each means of exposition, showing and telling, working in opposition to one another, forming a narrative puzzle of sorts that pulls double duty, creating a sense of depth and conflict within the character naturally, while also hinting towards a scarring history or backstory for Guts as the protagonist, leaving us as an audience wonder, why the charade? Why the conflict of action and mindset? And for us to ask that sort of question this early on, to achieve that level of character in the first few chapters, it's nothing short of remarkable. And that's not even to make mention of these strange existential Orwellian dreams he's haunted by, hinting perhaps at a fear he has of what tasks lay before him on his journey. Only time will tell, I guess. Oh, also, this brand or scar on his neck summons evil spirits, so not ideal. Could it be connected to the nightmares? Well, I mean, I've read all of the arcs, so yeah, it sure seems to be the case, and either way, it makes for some really cool looking imagery. And while I'm on the topic of imagery, man, this manga looks good. Like, mmm. That's a spicy meatball! I'm very impressed not just with the anatomy, layouts, or use of shadows, but the restraint he employs to draw attention to certain aspects and to not clutter his pages also. For instance, Right after Puck's will-they-won't-they they budding bromance with Guts starts, the two of them hitch a ride through the dark, monster-ridden forest with an old man and a young girl. This, for me, was where the manga really caught my attention in the best of ways. It's important in this moment for us to see the dead rising from the depths of the forest as if spewing out from the fog, and Miura's use of white space helps to achieve that nicely. Also, I'm a big fan of... Spooky, scary skeletons. So, extra points for that. And once again, he do be swinging that big sword pretty big. Clearly, this was drawn by a mangaka that loved what he was doing. The attention to detail, the generous page space dedicated to the initial strike, with ample time given to the follow through on the following pages. Every single time he swings this fridge door at someone, it's given special treatment. As it should, it's an awesome shot. It looks so good in fact, I didn't even really mind the fact that the only reason they came into conflict with the skeletons in the first place came down to the idiotic choice of a little girl. Oh, she's a demon. And she trapped them on purpose. Hey, that's pretty good. I'm not even remotely kidding when I say that around every corner, something happens that quickly grabs your attention in this manga, and it never lingers long enough either to get boring or overstay its welcome. In fact, it felt like Miura was trying his best to express what these scenes needed in as efficient a way as possible. Take, for example, this scene with the little girl. First, we see that Guts is busy with the spooky, scary Second, we see Puck notice something in the carriage. Third, we see the disembodied head of the driver. Fourth, we see Guts and Puck react, with Guts's reaction reinforcing his good tough guy persona, hesitating, not wanting to hurt the little girl, and in the process, get stabbed. This is all slowly but effectively building tension to the final shot, where he swings his big sword yet again, only this time, unlike all of the other instances that preceded this big swing, there's no focus on the gore of the situation, there's no focus on how badass the moment might be. It's looked on from afar as the dramatic and tragic, unfortunate death that it is. One that befell a young, innocent girl. This, this is the difference between a mangaka that just wants to draw cool stuff and a mangaka that wants to draw a great manga that he believes in. Furthermore, Kentaro Miura really leans into the anguish, frustration, and hurt in both Guts and Puck during the aftermath as they have to contend with this growing swarm of the undead. And again, the focus isn't on the awesome visuals that do eventually come, but instead it's focusing on the struggle and mental state of Guts as he coughs up blood and staggers to his feet before he eventually psychs himself up, pushes his humanity to the side, and bodies the seemingly bottomless swarm of the undead in what I can only describe as an impossibly exhausting effort, with it being once again presented expertly in this impressive two-page spread, and I say impressive for a specific reason. What's interesting about this shot, to me at least, is how Miura decided to present the character of Guts. Ask any artist where expression comes from, and nine times out of ten they will often say either the eyes, the mouth, or some place on the face itself. Most action shots in manga place heavy emphasis on this for that reason, but as you can see, Miura drew him without a face in this shot, instead opting to shroud it in shadow. 
Now, on top of it looking cool, it plays a further role in visually communicating his characterization, made all the more effective when you realize that the previous massive swings of his sword that we've seen came with this shadow effect over his face also, reinforcing the notion that while Guts can bring himself to perform these grotesque acts and ignore the consequences of the life he leads, for him to actually live with it, he has to push a significant part of himself away, removing his humanity both figuratively through what he says and demonstrated visually through the shadow over his face in these illustrations. In other words, he's forcing himself to become a monster to defeat these monsters. A perfect marriage of the visual and narrative utility. And as dawn breaks through the darkness of the night, bringing an end to the battle, an ethereal, otherworldly voice bellows from deep in the woods, citing, and I quote, We are always watching and you belong to me. We want your heart. In the past, Guts has criticized the weak time and again because he believes that the weak can't be free. And now, having heard this voice, I'm starting to see why Guts places so much emphasis on freedom now. Yeah, but first a quick word from our sponsor. I've mentioned before that this year is one for health and fitness. In fact, as you watch this, I'll be in Scotland climbing Ben Nevis, the first of many challenges I hope to overcome in the coming months. To achieve this, I need to ensure that I'm eating healthily, which sure isn't easy on a schedule as busy as mine these days. Thankfully, that's where today's sponsor has been a great help. HelloFresh is a delicious recipe box service that offers fit and wholesome options that allow you to eat well without sacrificing flavor. All of HelloFresh's recipes come with pre-portioned ingredients which is not only a huge time saver when it comes to prep and cleanup, but thanks to their easy to follow instructions, it allows me to prepare fresh meals without much extra thought. What I've personally appreciated is the versatility of the service. There are a wealth of tasty options to explore from all over the world, and on top of that, you can customize them with the option of adding, swapping, or upgrading protein each week, or even throwing in protein into your veggie dishes for extra flexibility. There are delicious extras like desserts and sides, and even premium meals for those those special occasions. Seriously, head over to HelloFresh.com right now and see the wealth of recipes on offer. If you use code NOTMARK16, you can also get up to 16 free meals and three surprise gifts. I seriously recommend it. And what's great is that it's incredibly sustainable too. Not only are you wasting 25% less food on a whole, but HelloFresh is in fact 72% cheaper than dining at a restaurant and happens to be the first carbon neutral meal kit where nearly all of the packaging is recyclable. Delicious recipes, effortless prep, easy goal tracking, and it's sustainable. That's hard to beat. If that sounds good to you, then once again, go to HelloFresh.com and use code NOTMARK16 for up to 16 free meals and three surprise gifts. The next section is by far and away the most substantial story sequence we've received thus far and I think if you were to ask anyone who's read this material what the best part of the arc was, it'd be this mini arc concerning Guts's dance with the evil count of this poor misfortunate village. It's got all the normal bells and whistles I've come to expect from this story thus far, only everything is turned up to 11, with more gore than I've seen in the manga, with a touch of body horror. And by a touch of body horror I mean, holy hell what the hell is that then kill it with fire! <clears throat> Up until now, the story, rightfully, has focused on characterizing Guts and Puck as well as fleshing out the wider world and its mechanics for us as an audience. Now that those introductions are done, it's time to settle into the first substantial mini-arc of the story. One that I noticed may have heavily influenced an anime I saw a few years ago. So obviously, in fact, that I'd find it hard to believe that they aren't at the very least influenced either by each other or by the same source. It can't be a coincidence. But yeah, I'll make sure to mention that when I get there. But for now, this story story kicks off in a very western fashion, as our lone ranger Guts encounters a tyrannical, vindictive, and seemingly careless count after he enters his town. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this count isn't a great leader? After having finished this arc, looking back, I think it's interesting to see how many parallels were being set up right from the get-go between the Count and Guts respectively. Subtle as they are, I think it helped to build up what eventually became a similarity between them as well as a powerful theme in this story, exploring what lengths people will go to in order to deal with pain, loss, and suffering. 
On a plot front, there's some interesting set pieces that really made this feel distinct to a lot of the other scenarios we've encountered leading up. Everything else before now, I realized was just training wheels. And I say this because once we learned the Count's true intentions and physical makeup, I was greeted by imagery that actually made me wince with how disgusting and horrific everything looked. Primarily once the Count starts possessing people and growing his slug-like slimy body inside them like some sort of weird parasite- what? So, okay, remember when I spoke about this are clearly being inspired or maybe inspiring a specific anime I watched? Well, it all came to my attention in the third chapter of The Guardian of Desire, within which there's an image that looks very reminiscent of numerous shots from the Parasite the Maxim franchise's monster. So close, in fact, that I'm convinced this is where Parasite Guy got his idea from. But... I'm not certain that's the case. Both this manga and Parasite came out at roughly the same time, and given that both share such similar imagery with this concept, one is either emulating the other or they both saw the same inspiration from a third party elsewhere. Either way, it's a cool as hell shot and one that's remained in my memory since long after. From a choreography standpoint, the fight scenes in this arc just get better and better by building on the prior material in the story. Throughout this story, we've been introduced to the series of different weapons in Guts' arsenal, like the giant fridge, I mean, big, big sword, uh, his concealed crossbow, and to my surprise, this massive explosive flamethrower on his wrist. And yes, it's as awesome as it sounds. And through two primary plot threads in this arc, we're shown the depths of what Guts is capable of and what makes the Count tick. Is he 100% evil, or is there something or someone that he cares about? From a narrative standpoint, I like how they handle the nuance of the Count's dwindling humanity. Naturally, he's a despicable monster that locks his own child away from the world, but he's still a father that, while making horrific decisions here and there, and everywhere, also, more or less, is coming from a place of love and fear of losing that love. And while it doesn't justify it, it at least humanizes him somewhat. And as he possesses his subordinates and fights with guts in gripping confrontations like small close quarter exchanges in cellars or up staircases, he becomes more and more of a monster, both figuratively and physically, with his very design reflecting that. Simultaneously, thanks to Puck, that horror is balanced through light-hearted, carefully exposed insight into the daughter's life or lack thereof. But before we proceed, there's still one more character I haven't mentioned, and his name is Vargas. Effectively, he serves the narrative purpose of highlighting the Count's cruelty and Guts' increasing ambivalence towards justice. Vargas is introduced to the story early on after Guts runs into trouble in the town by bailing him out of a dicey situation. He's disfigured, poor, and like many others, had tragedy befall him and his family by way of the Count's cruelty. And he also has this weird egg face thing that Guts has a lot of interest in. More on that in just a second though. At every turn, Guts refuses to avenge his family and to take down the Count, even after Vargas's execution, which offered up some brilliantly effective moments to demonstrate Guts' mindset versus how he's trying to feel. It's an aspect of this arc I thoroughly enjoyed, watching how he keeps trying to be something he's not. He tries to be detached, cold and dispassionate. He tries to tell himself this lie so often that it directly results in the execution of Vargas the man that reached out to him when he needed help. Despite trying to distance himself from his own humanity, Guts' disappointment and frustration rises. He cares, but doesn't want to. He doesn't want to hurt more than he already does, so he tells himself this useful fiction. That strength is the only thing that matters, and that the weak mean nothing in order to continue living in relative peace of mind. And as the circumstances worsen, eventually he finds a way of tackling the issue. He vows to kill the Count. Again, lying to himself that it's for no other apparent reason than that he wants to, or perhaps needs to be a certain way. To think that, had he managed to reconcile this side of himself earlier, Vargas could have been saved. It's the first in what I bet will become a long list of consequences for Guts to live with. The eventual fight, however, that takes place is brilliant in its own right. Taking elements we've learned about Guts and placing him in a situation where his back is very literally and figuratively up against a wall. Under pressure is where we learn what characters are capable of and, interestingly, Guts shows how perceptive he is by taking the Count's one weakness, his daughter 
Theresia hostage in the heat of battle. There's some terrific imagery that superbly communicates how bloodthirsty he can bring himself to be, but I think this mode of action works for Guts because he recognizes what it is about the Count that he feels he understands. He believes the Count won't attack his daughter. And finally, speaking more broadly, I just love how weird this story gets. Just when I thought that Guts had defeated the Count there and then, they all go to another dimension thanks to that weird egg thing. I mean, We've gone, I would argue, on a steady progression from what appeared to be an angry man with a big sword in a medieval setting to a full-on dark fantasy epic complete with dimensional demons and an angry man with a big sword that also has a troubled backstory. This mini-arc within the greater Black Swordsman arc is hugely entertaining. It provides a culmination of what little exposition we've been given about the character of Guts up until this point and the antagonist he's facing in the Count highlights a similarity between the two of them but in doing so brings to the forefront the greatest difference they share. While each of their respective outlooks and decisions are made out of fear, doubt, and a host of negative issues, in the face of overwhelming sadness, as well as emotional and physical torment, the Count in the past chose the easy option to remove his humanity, to numb the pain and loss of his wife, whereas Guts chose to live with it and uses it as fuel to drive him on to do the great things that we've seen him demonstrate. With him throughout this arc having many ups and downs, successes and shortcomings, ultimately resulting in his defeated limp body resting on the floor. Yet even in the face of what must be overwhelming pain, depicted through his broken fingers and dangling limbs, he still as tenacious as ever gets up, ever struggling, ever pushing towards freedom. Freedom from his circumstances and freedom I'd wager at this point from whatever is haunting him in his past. If that isn't inspirational, I don't know what is. Okay, so now that we're in this weird demon dimension, we're greeted by the council of evil looking characters. With the preceding scenes serving to emphasize for us the slippery slope such thinking like the Count has implemented brings him. Having already done the unthinkable to his wife before, he is now destined for hell. He's owned by the demons, making it even easier to commit the same heinous acts again to his daughter. However, this is emphasized instead to amplify our appreciation for the Count's ultimate sacrifice. He loved his daughter too much much to give her up for his own sake. The little humanity that remained was enough to make the right decision. It should go without saying also that the visuals during this section are spectacular, with the highlight being the wide shot of the dimension and the souls reaching out of hell and grabbing a hold of the Count himself. Vargas and all. However, in what I anticipate will become typical berserk fashion, the Count's story ends by reaching out one last time for his daughter's hand. A request denied specifically and drawn attention to before in the story and throughout their relationship. Always denied before, this time however, shocked by the situation and what's come to light, she for the first time reaches back, but it's too late. His time is up, poetic and beautifully tragic. After that, we get a terrific glimpse at what I assume will be the big bad for the foreseeable future. Someone that, to Guts, seems to be a familiar face. Confirmed through flashbacks to their time spent as soldiers, what I love about that inclusion to the story is what it offered by way of, once again, visual direction and exposition. Instead of telling us how they feel about each other, we're shown. Taking all of this demonic glitz and glamour out of the equation and we have a story concerning the relationship between two men. One where, once upon a time, he tried to help Guts up to his feet after battle, but now he quite literally is beating him to the ground, insisting he stay there. We don't get much from this exchange, and in reality, I don't know much about this dynamic yet, but if Guts's relentless grit and determination carries him to his feet when he has nothing left at all in a last ditch effort to get a clean shot on this guy, it made me more than a little interested in how the relationship has spawned this reaction between them. Interestingly, in the same way many games begin by showing you how weak you are, Berserk's introductory arc reminds Guts how weak he is and by extension how trapped he really is, haunted by his branded reminder. And if it ended there, I'd have been happy. If it ended there, it would have been a fitting conclusion to what the story had been trying to achieve. But that wasn't enough for Berserk. After this scene, it decided to drop one more, a scene that I think provided the most powerful note in all of the arc. 
Throughout this review, you might have noticed that I've, at every opportunity, praised what I believe to be Berserk and Kentaro Miura's greatest attributes. Their dedication to consistent character writing and devotion to visual storytelling. And in this final scene, we get both of those in spades. After narrowly escaping this strange demonic dimension and having witnessed the death of the Count, just three individuals remain in a room together. The devastated Theresia, a confused Puck, and Guts just about managing a hobble. Aided by his sword acting as a crutch, an apt use for the instrument we have learned alleviated his suffering before through action. And while our eyes are initially drawn to Guts and his wounds, the grief of Theresia quickly takes hold. Having witnessed the horrific scenes mere moments ago, tragically she feels no other way to deal with these feelings, contemplating taking her own life. Puck, ever the compassionate voice, tries to comfort her, but nothing seems to work. She's heard and seen too much horror to ever be the same again, and that's when we get Guts chiming in. Offering her a dagger, she's now inches from doing so before the ground gives way beneath her. Clutching for life, she grasps at Guts's sword. Bleeding from her fingers, she climbs back up, now armed with renewed fire in her heart. A hatred for Guts, claiming that this was all his fault and that she will, one day, kill him. Guts staggers off, laughing with a cocky demeanor, until she's out of sight. Soon after, his face crumbles to end the chapter, and the Ark having granted Theresia the means with which to liberate herself from her one-time prison. What a stupendously orchestrated scene, climaxing with a telling revelation, not only informing us of how compassionate Guts truly is, but also further pointing us towards the reality that Guts shares more in common with this young girl than she even thinks. Taking themes from this arc and concentrating them into one magnificent gut punch that honestly left me teary-eyed and excited for more. Before starting this review, I knew virtually nothing about Berserk as a story. In my head, I worried it would be an action-heavy, narrative light affair, indulging its readers on a very rudimentary and shallow level with little at all to say. I was wrong. What I discovered was a lovingly composed, tortured introduction to a fascinating story detailing themes of hope, fear, and tragedy. Penned by one of the most impressive manga artists I've read the work of. Thank you all for recommending me this story. Rest in peace, Kentaro Miura. I can't wait to sink my teeth into more of your material. The funny thing is, I didn't even know at the time that the best arc of storytelling I'd ever read in my life was right around the corner in the Golden Age arc. Tell me why, tell me why, tell me what you want. I don't know why, don't know why, don't know why it's bad. Surging back into the past with the blink of an eye, we come to learn exactly how Guts became the person he is today. Outlining a chilling tale dealing with powerful themes of abuse, relationships, and one's own struggle to find their place in the world. This story is a work of art that, while passionate in its creation and telling, paints its most vibrant colors not with traditional tools, but with the more deviant, grotesque, and contorted aspects of its subject matter, humanity. Holding a mirror up to society as we view the early life of our main hero. Creating moments where I leapt from my seat with joy, grabbed this comically sized book and squeezed it. But above all else, it captured my attention from chapter one and never let go. It's difficult to know where to start with this review as there's an incredible amount to discuss and analyze, but I think the best place to start this review is chronologically, with the introduction of Guts to this big and bad world. The prologue. The material covered in this section details Guts's early childhood. In hindsight, while this can be seen as the prologue to the eventual epic that begins once Griffith arrives, much like our own childhood, many of the events in this portion, some mundane and others shocking, help aid us in better empathizing and understanding Berserk's characters. When you start from the beginning of a character's life like this, I've discovered it offers many ideal opportunities for elegant and telling pieces of dialogue, specifically because we've already spent a considerable amount of time with the character in his later life, forcing the explicit and even the subtly implicit moments to stand out to us all the more. For instance, something I found interesting right off the bat concerning Golden Age was that for a decent amount of its introduction, Guts 
doesn't say anything. In fact, his first piece of dialogue in this arc comes long after he should be able to speak as a child and it's not something he offers without antagonization. Growing up in a band of mercs, his mother after dying and his only father figure abusive, in the middle of a sword training session, the onlookers in the band jeer, why don't you use a sword more your size? And after being thrown to the floor, Guts passionately exclaims, no. Dotted throughout this first chapter, covering his life from birth to nine years of age, were offered small windows into intimate and character-defining moments in his life like this. Some as explicit as his proclivity for large weaponry, poetically gripping them tightly for security amidst the harsh and damaging upbringing, or other more subtle familiar actions like choosing to be there for his mom when she was passing away. Even from that young of an age, he was willing to take the more difficult option because it meant something to someone he cared for. That really paints all of this introduction. The events that he endures before the age of 10 are painfully human with some of the absolute worst aspects of our species laid to bear. It is horrific what happens to this child to say the least and helps inform me how he sees the world in the present day. I've certainly had times where as a child I've been convinced of one thing that an adult has said and has successfully concealed the truth. And as we look on almost exclusively through Guts's point of view, after having been told Gambino his father figure sold him off for the night authorizing this heinous act, it makes their encounter afterwards all the more unsettling and from a narrative point of view, interesting. The most interesting aspect of this prologue comes through the dissection and destruction of the only relationship Guts has in Gambino. Something I try to reliably do as a reader is to constantly be aware of what point of view I'm seeing certain events through. What we're implicitly told can be as important or more important than explicit information, particularly when it comes to coloring different characters. There are at least two significant events where we are shown that Gambino is directly involved on the page. A particular training session with Guts and his drawing drunken attempted murder of the young man to cap things off. Gambino is cruel, emotionally bankrupt, and he's all Guts has in the world. With his only substantial interactions coming by way of battle or training for battle, we see firsthand why swords and battle are the coping mechanisms Guts has shown a preference for. And as Guts gets revenge on his attacker, Gambino loses his leg and the years drift on by, until we hit the climax to this prologue. A climax that hit like a train. Drunk, he eventually admits that he did accept payment for the heinous act committed unto Guts earlier in his life, admitting that he hates him, and in that same breath, attacks Guts, launching forward with his sword. <laughs> Running for his life, terrified, and after suffering a tremendous fall, the chaotic nature of this manga finally relents unveiling panels around these quiet, intimate moments that are nothing short of breathtaking. Don't get me wrong, I love Miura's big action set pieces too, but there's nothing I enjoy more than his tranquil pieces, more personal moments Gut shares with us as readers. And throughout this arc, my favorite illustrations from Miura are not the action-heavy or horrific renderings of the epic or fierce. They aren't the shocking or the scarring, but instead the tranquil the peaceful beauty that can be found amidst the most chaotic of misfortunes. Band of the Falcon. This is it. The section we're introduced to Griffith and the group of adolescent mercenaries he leads. After a dominant performance in a village earning him some serious coin, Guts begins making his way out of town when he's attacked by a group of Griffith's crew members. This is the inciting incident that leads Guts and Griffith down one of the most interesting journeys I've experienced in manga. It seems at this point there's a clear pecking order with Casca being the number two to Griffith's clear and far away number one. This is a leader, while Young is seen almost as a god by those in his stead. And once Guts wakes up, partially recovered from his previous injuries courtesy of Griffith himself, we get a short tour around the camp, getting introduced to the rest of the band, but all of that is small potatoes compared to this. Guts versus Griffith. The fight that takes place between Griffith and Guts is spectacular beyond measure and I will be using it to structure this particular review. From a design point of view, I love how these two characters are effectively polar opposites of each other. Guts is rough around the edges, emotional with dark features, while Griffith is calm and smooth with fair, delicate features. You can tell everything you need to know about these two characters just by looking at their swords and how they wield them. Guts with two hands attacks aggressively charging forward while Griffith parries the oncoming attacks from Guts 
while only using one hand on his weapon. And when it comes to the makeup of their blades, we're greeted with even more information. Guts uses a large hunk of iron, while Griffith a far more dignified and modestly sized blade, with some flashy trimming on the hilt. I love attention to details like this. It's a superbly stunning design, everything from their opposing colored clothes to their hair and even their faces that they make during the fight. Guts's grimace contrasted heavily by the composed and almost emotionless expression of Griffith. From a visual perspective, this fight, even in its opening exchanges, has more working in its favor than so, so many others. And given that I know what the relationship amounts to later, seeing this first proper clash, I was extremely invested. And I haven't even mentioned the best part of the fight, the actual fight. This altercation was made with the understanding that if Guts kills Griffith, he goes free. And if Griffith wins, then Guts will be his. Understanding these consequences, watching as Griffith expertly evades and makes Guts look like an amateur was nerve wracking. But no matter how much Griffith pushes Guts, Guts would always dig even deeper and never said die. This comes to a head, however, when after a massive swing of his sword, Griffith, composed as ever, leaps onto Guts's blade, having closed the distance and placed himself in a victorious position, blade pointed squarely at the throat of Guts. He asks for Guts' surrender, and he refuses. Ever defiant, he declares, I'll show you how mouths should be used in a fight. This was the single most cathartic moment in the manga that I've experienced so far, watching as Griffith's holier-than-thou ass was thrown to the ground with Guts laying a few good hits into boot. This only further bonded me to the tenacious and sympathetic personality that is guts of berserk. The dialogue in this section is spectacular, with Griffith at one point holding up Guts' sword saying, it's an amazing sword, I could never wield it. If we want to, for a second, speak thematically, this could mean a number of things, but because the sword represents Guts' only security against the darkness in his mind, then perhaps what Griffith means, or what it can be interpreted as thematically here, is Griffith may not have shared a similar past and therefore can't wield such a burdensome weapon. With even scenes that take place as early in his life coming with familiar lines like, the way you fight, it's almost as though you're gambling on your own life. This fight, <clears throat> it honestly had everything from stakes an audience can get behind, compelling character writing, making in-character decisions, and the best artwork in framing the series has shown me yet. This was some top-tier stuff, climaxing with a telling and thematically resonant declaration from Griffith once he outmaneuvers and takes Guts out. Now, you belong to me. The Aftermath. Once the agreement was made, Guts became an acting member of this young band of mercs, doing exceptionally well in his first outing with the group, earning their respect after the trouble he caused initially. There's a scene that takes place atop the castle tower that I'd like to address, and I might be reading into it a little much, but I'm a big fan of these quiet character moments, and there might be something worth reading into in this scene. Right after his first day making a splash, a party is held for Guts in his honor. Reluctant to join in, even when dragged down, he always feels most comfortable when he's left alone. Oftentimes in the past, even when he first picked up by this group, he sits with his back to something and his sword held closely. In this instance, Guts chooses to sit atop the castle in a similar fashion, but what really caught my attention more than anything else was this pose he struck. The morning after, sitting atop the castle, talking to Judo. This is a strange pose, and from a body language point of view, it makes sense for him to take this guarded position, considering the subject matter they're covering in this conversation is a little personal. But I think it could mean a little more than that. He's covering a specific part of his face around his nose. The scar that lingers and was etched onto his character design was given to him by his abusive father figure after he lashed out at him. I wonder if perhaps Miura drew guts in this scene with Judo touching his scar because, unlike the place where he grew up yearning for something, somewhere to call home, in this band of young mercenaries he might actually find family. In his mind, he feels like he perhaps might have something here. And once the subject turns to Griffith again, he immediately clutches his sword once more. To end things, the chapter and glimpse of this time period in Guts's life comes to a close in a rather remarkable way. With him happy. After achieving a believable friendship now with some select members of the group and with him starting to, on some level, bring his walls down, Guts, still an adolescent, now in command of his own small group, can look into the future, optimistically perhaps. But I'd be remiss if I didn't mention one final aspect of this section that caught my attention that I think is majorly important moving forward. The declaration Griffith made, citing that he wants a kingdom and that Guts belongs to him. 
Having read the prior material, one of the themes emphasized and explored in great detail was that of freedom and the lengths one would go, specifically Guts, to retain that freedom. During the Black Swordsman arc, Guts valued freedom above all else, and I don't think I need to be a genius to put two and two together here in this instance. Something's gotta happen. Now, it's about at this time in my script writing process, I realized that if I were to proceed like this through the events of the story, the video in question would be about 90 minutes long and I would be repeating myself ad nauseum. And due to this fact, I was faced with a difficult decision to make. How should I structure this? How do I tackle this massive story? And then I asked myself, what were the most important aspects of this story? And my answer, the characters. Something I think is important to mention at this point is that I recognize the significance of Nosferatu Zod, the battle for Daldry, and the absence of demonic creatures throughout this review of the story. However, having come from the Black Swordsman arc set after this, we saw all sorts of strange creatures one after another. The significance of these aspects, or lack thereof in this story, I thought would be better suited for the second part of this Golden Age review, as I think dividing Zod's prophecy between two videos could get a little messy. So, rest assured, I will be talking about that in the next Berserk review. From this point on, I'd like to go a little more abstract with my approach to this review and talk specifically about the themes and dynamics of different characters that drive this section of the story towards its conclusion. Starting with... Griffith. Griffith is an astonishingly brilliant character to structure this entire story around. As I mentioned before in my dissection of his and Guts' first duel, he is pitch perfect in both how he's handled and what he says in this story. If ever I saw a character whose dynamic gave a particular story everything they possibly could, Griffith would fit that billing to a T. The means with which Miura introduces and builds this character up over the course of the narrative is not only enjoyable but also creates suspense. In a in a sense, it's difficult to discuss Griffith in any meaningful capacity without referring to his effect on other people in the greater story. Stories are, after all, normally about conflict typically between two or more characters, but Griffith, more so than any character in this story, has the makeup of his character delivered almost exclusively through how he speaks and how others view him. Throughout the entirety of this story that I've read for the purposes of this video, from the beginning to the morning of departure, chapter three, virtually no internal dialogue is given to us as readers from Griffith's perspective. Now, many of you at this point might be saying, so, who cares if we don't see his internal yammerings? What does that matter? Well, it matters primarily because this arc deals with the interpersonal relationships between many different characters, many of which include Griffith as a primary player. And without his internal monologue to let us as viewers into understanding what he's honestly thinking, it achieves elegantly and precisely just the right dynamic that allows this arc to work as well as it does. It gives us all the information we need, but doesn't tell us what to do with that information. Off the back of the prologue, the cast surrounding Guts explodes as we get to know the band of the Hawk through the likes of Casca, Judo, Corcus, Pippin, Rickard, etc. But notice how I didn't mention Griffith. While Griffith plays an enormous role in the success of this arc, we don't really at any point get to know him like we do the other characters, and certainly not on the same level as we do with the likes of Casca and Guts. We do receive quiet moments with just Griffith and Guts from time to time, but the only reason I'm sure of those instances is due to Griffith's scarcity in in the narrative. Let's take these scenes for example. There are a number of scenes where Guts and Griffith talk and where Griffith even talks with others in his follow, but we never see what he's actually thinking. We only ever really receive speculation from Guts and with increasing frequency, the larger group constantly praising Griffith. At first as a great leader of warrior until he reaches goal after goal after goal in which people then start to refer to him as otherworldly or godlike. And this positioning the narrative places Griffith in the story is primarily what drives the suspense moving forward. We know what Griffith wants, we know what his goal is and we know what he's willing to do to achieve these ends but we have no idea what he's really thinking that's what makes this scene from the assassin chapter so interesting to me in essence, it's a small portion of story centered around General Julius's jealousy of the newly appointed Griffith. And as has been the case with many of the other stories in this arc, both Griffith and Guts play leading roles. There's an entire panel dedicated to the conflict in Guts' mind and in fittingly poetic fashion at the chapter's climax. Having been assigned by Griffith to kill those
clothes that would do him harm. In addition to killing his target and the slimy general Julius, he also kills Julius' son following the secondary order of leaving no witnesses. Now, he didn't know that this was a kid, let alone his, when he killed him, but it was a magnificent example of Guts mindlessly following someone because he believed in him. Perhaps more than anyone else in the world. Which makes you wonder, would he have done anything he asked? And if that's true, then has Guts really sold his soul to this man Griffith completely? Does he really belong to him? Was what Griffith said when he won the duel entirely true? Then aside from the clearly morally reprehensible acts Guts is committing on his allies' behalf, where's this sense of conflict we feel in the story coming from? Well, throughout this story, we felt Guts gravitate towards this group reluctantly. We felt the sense of family begin to foster within him, as well as the comrades he goes into battle with. In battles with terrifying monsters, we've seen Griffith put his life on the line time and again in the name of saving Guts from certain death. With him saying to Guts's face, do I need a reason each time I put myself at harm's way for your sake? And now, after climbing out of the sewer like a rat, leaving a trail of death in his wake, Guts, looking to speak with what he would consider a friend, stands at the base of a large staircase as both him and Casca watch on as Griffith, sitting atop a stairs, out of reach, discusses philosophy with the princess he's courting, ending with the most biting quote of all, highlighting how single-minded he is in his vision, his conquest, and never-ending pursuit to his one goal of his. When asked directly about his friends or troop, he says something to the princess that sets the wheels in motion for what will become his downfall in this section of the story. He says, they are excellent troops. Together we have faced death so many times. They are valuable comrades devoting themselves to the dream I envision. But to me, a friend is something else. Someone who would never depend upon another's dream, someone who wouldn't be compelled by anyone, but would determine and pursue his own reason to live. And should anyone trample that dream, he would oppose him body and soul, even if the threat were me myself. What I think a friend is, is one who is my equal. As readers, having been forced to contend with the moral ambiguity of the main character's violent actions, knowing full well he wishes for a relationship with Griffith and knowing that he didn't enjoy doing what he did that night, we have to watch Guts hear, digest, and understand that statement from Griffith, encapsulated beautifully and as succinctly as anything I've seen by the following page, highlighting just how many levels of difference there are, both physically and figuratively, between those two characters. The hired assassin, fresh from the sewer, acting on someone else's behalf without question, and the clean and dignified visionary who pursues with unwavering focus towards his ultimate dream. Such poetry we do not normally see in manga, and now we have direct conflict, spawning from a desire born from Guts' childhood and trauma. What an astonishingly great scene. There's absolutely more I want to discuss regarding this character, but for now, let's move on to another for a brief moment. Casca. Casca is the third spoke on this narrative wheel alongside Guts and Griffith. With respect to Guts and Griffith, she represents Guts' relationship with the Band of the Hawk, acts as a bridge to Griffith during numerous conversations for Guts, and, perhaps most crucially, she represents and highlights how the broader Band of the Hawk and all who fall under Griffith's spell praise, adulate, and glorify him, creating a man bigger than legend itself, further serving and leaning into the composed deification, for lack of a better term, that Griffith seems to want to promote around him while, and this is my speculation, leveraging the trauma and yearning for acceptance these forgotten toys of the wider berserk world cry out for in his stead. Clearly, as made evident by the contents of this video review, berserk, and more specifically this arc, is centered around two characters in Griffith and Guts. However, there's a fascinating section of this story which allows Casca to take center stage and to no longer play the seldom seen secondary character role she has been following up until this point. It all begins in the day of the big battle against the White Whale Knights, and as a quick aside, every action this band takes is to the end of elevating not only themselves, but primarily Griffith as he works his way from lowly commoner to leader of a mercenary group, to a knight, to a general, and so on and so forth. And during the events of this section, we are very much entrenched in that struggle for elevation and promotion. One of the most significant themes following the character of Casca is one of acceptance, tying wonderfully into Guts' sense of worthlessness. She now, during this significant battle starts to find sudden difficulty due to her own natural biological complications that set her apart from this old-fashioned world of men, reminding her that despite her decision to live like a man, there are some things that can't be avoided and this same aspect of her leads to guts, someone who's constantly nagging and poking fun at her for being a girl. However, thanks to the time
time they spend together, he soon realizes and grows to appreciate and admire how much more difficult and tough it must be to be a woman warrior in this instance. Citing her as above all the other weaklings at the reception following the battle, showing a true sign of respect on his behalf. Their budding relationship, platonic or otherwise for me, was a phenomenal secondary plot thread which contrasts her extreme and limitless admiration for Griffith with her natural and organic relationship with Guts. The history that's unearthed concerning her past as well as the bond she reluctantly forms with a person she at one point hated for reasons I'll get into in just a sec, Guts, was both symbolically beautiful as all Miura works normally are, but it also illuminated a dynamic that I wasn't aware of. Being one of the main characters involved in Guts' recruiting, we get to see her side of the story as she admits to, at one point in time, hating Guts, bringing to light the reason behind her constant frustrations and anger towards him over the years. Revealing a damaging backstory and unhealthy the admiration for Griffith and a lack of appreciation for Guts as well as those around her by extension. In essence, I felt as though, while reading these chapters, the more Casca got to know and interact with Guts, the more the two of them gained a deeper understanding of themselves, the more deeper appreciation and empathy for each other they felt. Placed in high-risk scenarios as Guts single-handedly slaughters 100 men all by himself in the name of buying her time and to get help, but also for another reason I want to touch on in just a sec. Once they return to the site where she last saw Guts fighting for his life, we see bodies strewn across the land as Guts, holding himself up with the help of a tree and his trusty sword, stands victorious. There have been a number of instances throughout this story where Guts has run into trouble on his own, causing Griffith to put his life on the line for his sake, leading to Casca's hatred for how careless Guts can be and jealousy as to why she can't be cared for like that by Griffith. After the entire outing takes place and resolves itself, she gets what she wanted. For Griffith to outwardly state that she is a valued member. And while she does get that, we as readers also see firsthand that despite Griffith having had nothing to do with this achievement from Guts, despite Guts getting praised for his monumentous undertaking, others still use this as an opportunity to highlight how amazing Griffith is in comparison. If Guts is this good, imagine how amazing Griffith could be. This has been something that's been alluded to numerous times, and while I was aware of it, this was the moment it cemented for me my feelings on the Griffith character. Campfire of Dreams Campfire of Dreams is my favourite chapter in all of the manga that I've read so far. This is the single most touching and spectacularly beautiful chapter I think I've ever read in my life, all the while highlighting exactly what it is about this story that makes it so special to me. There's no fighting, there's no dynamic action sequences, there's no violence, it's just a quiet moment two friends share from a familiar distance to the night's festivities. As Guts, for what feels like the first time, decides to speak his mind and let someone else in and know how he feels. He begins revealing how he wasn't fighting back there to protect her against those 100 enemies, but instead did so in essence because it's who he thinks he is. It's what comes naturally and highlights how he has nothing else in his life. He admires Casca and Griffith for feeling so strongly about their dreams and that due to the discrepancy between them, he feels alienated even when looking down at all the individual lights painted across the land in his honor. His dream, whether he wants it to be or not, isn't here with these people, and taking what Griffith said to heart, he wants to fight tooth and nail to find something he can live to die for. Much like the rest of this arc, it's a 10 out of 10, but because it resonated with me so powerfully, I needed to dedicate a small bit of this video's runtime to it. But the main takeaway? Guts is leaving, and it'll be after the next campaign. The Morning Departure. This is a special section of storytelling for me, and figuring out a way to effectively describe what I felt while reading has been the cause for many redrafts of this particular video essay's review. There have been certain iconic scenes I've read through that have taken my breath away, whether it be through childhood or my adult life. I've looked back at all of these in retrospect and was able to on some level figure out how they in fact pulled off what made them so special to me. And what makes this particular scene all the more impactful, for me anyway, is that despite the largest and most impressive battle taking place in the form of the battle to claim Tudor's stronghold, the battle, while impressive and yet again containing many story beats concerning Guts, Casca, and Griffith respectively, it is but a footnote in my mind compared to one of the single best rematches in all of Japanese storytelling that I've seen personally. Guts versus Griffith, round two. 
I think for me what made this particular encounter so earth-shattering came in two waves. The first being the least impressive narratively, so let's get that out of the way first. Up until this point there has been a considerable and measured approach taken when comparing and growing the relationships between Guts and Griffith. The first major confrontation between them came about at a time when Guts was much younger, less experienced, and not to mention injured. However, this was not much mentioned beyond one or two passing comments acknowledging that. Additionally, over the course of the time they spent together, Griffith and Guts haven't exactly been short and time spent together alone on the page, sharing moments of levity as well as deep contemplation, with Guts very clearly acting as someone Griffith can confide in. However, and this has been made evident since the very beginning, Griffith isn't a normal person in this story with not a single individual seeing him as someone that they can build a meaningful relationship with. He's always on another level, which brings me to my favorite aspect of this story. Nothing is explicitly told to us. We are left to infer for ourselves what the relationships are or are not. Who is connected to reality and who isn't? Casca idolizes Griffith. She wishes to, quote, be his sword, meaning that she wants to be the best warrior she can so that when the time comes, she can be what Griffith needs her to be in combat to defend him. In addition to that, practically every single sentence a character utters in this story concerning Griffith holds him in the same regard as a deity. In addition to every single last plot element of the story being told, created with the express purpose of elevating or protecting Griffith's standing, helping him to reach his overall goal of ruler. Which conflicted magnificently with the character of Guts. Having grown to be a mountain of a man and having grown closer to Griffith than he was with any of the others up until now, maybe excluding Casca, for him to be confronted with the notion that yet again he's worthless compared to him and that Griffith has been using him to meet his end all this time, it must be a bitter reality to come to terms with. And when Guts decides to leave, quote, once again is thrown out by Griffith, you belong to me. This is his mask off moment, at least for me. A moment that signifies that while everything has developed over the last three years from their status to their interpersonal relationships as soldiers and comrades, Griffith is still very much the exact same person who said those words that day. Which brings me to something I noticed about the dialogue and the visuals during this section. The duel that takes place isn't necessarily what impresses me about this section, but the swirling of doubt in my mind that took place during it. I was ridiculously nervous for Guts during his lead up for the first swing. But now, looking back, I realize that I had no reason to. This is the very first time we are, as readers, allowed to see into Griffith's thought process unabated for a consistent amount of time which allows us to see his actual thoughts on a broader subject. Unlike the first encounter, we do not see anything from Guts's point of view. Everything is from Griffith's. From the commentary, the strategy he's looking to employ, to how he's evaluating the situation, weather and environment. It is ridiculously thorough as we experience firsthand how comprehensive and contemplative the proficient Griffith is being. Bolstered in part in my mind by the constant praise he's received all the time leading up to this moment. In my mind, He's better than Guts. And when the swing does come down, so too does the world Griffith has made crumble. Visually, I don't think I need to explain what makes this spectacular, so I'll just dance across my favorite aspects of it quickly. The mindset of Guts is a total opposite compared to their last, with his facial expressions and his positioning in many panels reflecting that reality. Guts now pictured higher than the once more domineering Griffith, painted all across the backdrop of a sun rising anew, symbolizing a fresh start on the morning snow. The shock that floods across Griffith's face as he drops to his knees in utter despair when faced with the sudden reality of his situation was massively satisfying. Guts is more powerful than Griffith. He's leaving and Griffith needs him. I want to make clear right now that I have absolutely zero idea as to how this story arc will complete, but I have a feeling that despite the horrific stuff I've seen so far, I've seen nothing yet. Throughout what I've read so far, I've seen in this material Griffith will do just about anything to give himself what he needs to succeed, and I don't think he would have made it this far if something like this was going to stop him. He's going to retaliate, but I have no idea how. I've never read Berserk before, but Kentaro Miura's sophomore outing in Golden Age utterly broke me. 
Berserk's Golden Age is a prequel story about how the series' main protagonist, Guts, became the man he is in the present day. Following him from his literal birth until the lowest moments of his life, in essence, this is Guts' backstory and in my opinion is easily the best origin I've come across in recent memory. In the first part of this, I explored what turned out to be the upbeat section of this tale as we observed the complex relationships and dynamics organically forming around the main cast of characters suddenly experiencing a fissure unlike anything I've seen before in manga. A fissure not driven by hatred or anger, but of ambition and hope. Advice taken on board. With the story in question ending in one of the most hopeless and horrifying places I think I may ever read or see. And what happens between these two moments in time is one of the best examples of character-driven storytelling and character torture I've seen put to paper and indeed one of the greatest, if not the greatest, narrative performance in all of manga that I've read. And I'm not afraid to say that, better than anything I've seen presented by Dragon Ball, Hunter x Hunter, Jojo, or indeed One Piece. If you've ever expressed an interest in learning how to write compelling or exciting stories with complex characters and motivations, Berserk's 1997 climax to the Golden Age arc is something to be studied. Speaking as someone that reviews anime and manga for a living, something I routinely have to contend with is the relentless amount of fan service in these stories oftentimes. I get it, sex sells and all, but at the end of the day, to me it feels like a crutch or at the very least an annoying distraction that takes from what I'm really interested in, the story. Which is of course why I watched Keijo. Kintaro Miura on the other hand is something of a savant when it comes to writing these types of scenes. Instead of feeling bored or annoyed by tired and overdone tropes getting in the way of the story, I'm instead captured captivated by these scenes as they not only enhance the story, but they are essential in exposing us to integral and emotionally revealing character differences. Something that's abundantly clear in Berserk's Golden Age arc is that it's centered around not just one character or a group of characters necessarily, but a set of relationships and how they contrast in subtle and stark fashion, with the two main relationships explored after this duel being Guts and Casca and Griffith and Charlotte. And what I thought these scenes achieved perhaps above all else was their highlighting of the existing differences between Guts and Griffith as well as their approach to their respective encounters. Once their duel concludes, both Guts and Griffith, albeit at different times, have to face the consequences of their actions. Griffith now has to face a soul-crushing trip back to reality and Guts has to reconcile what became of his friends after his decision. In other words, both Guts and Griffith's characters are exposed to a tremendous amount of pressure. And that's important. One of the most important techniques to make use of as a writer is one that allows you to communicate to your audience who your characters are in a believable fashion. Much the same as real life, someone's true character is only revealed under pressure. I've mentioned this before, but author, professor, and story consultant Robert McKee put it best in his book entitled Story. True character is revealed in the choices a human being makes under pressure. The greater the pressure, the deeper the revelation, the truer the choice to the character's essential nature. These high stakes, high pressure scenes are in essence what turns otherwise boring characters into fan favorites, villains, heroes, or otherwise. Take for example, Disney's The Lion King. What? All right, okay, I can see you all rolling your eyes from here. But really, techniques in storytelling are present across all genres, even ones as different as Berserk and The Lion King. In this film, Simba is introduced as a headstrong, naive, and in many ways, arrogant kid impatiently waiting for his time in the sun as king of the Pride Lands to begin. At this point, as an audience, we have no reason to care for him as a character necessarily. We appreciate he's a kid, he's cute, and he has some great parents, but he's not proven himself to us. And so, that's where this scene comes in the elephant graveyard. In this, Simba drags his friend Nala into a life or death situation thanks to his own inability to see the woods from the trees. But in the elephant graveyard, despite being terrified and in way over his head, Simba still goes back to save Nala against those monsters he knows can kill him. This is the moment we as fans of The Lion King learn to respect and appreciate Simba's character. And it's one of the many reasons why the live action remake fails in capturing that same magic because they cut that scene out of the film. Now we have no reason to like Simba and as a result, the film feels hollow. And I labor that point for one specific reason. It's the very technique Miura's perfected. The technique that turned guts from a character we appreciate to one we despair, hope, and pray for 
in the end. Following that crushing defeat during his duel with Guts, Griffith, shaken to his very core, feeling like he's lost control of everything in his life, grabs the nearest branch on his fall down to reality. And in a desperate attempt to seize control of something, he forces himself onto Princess Charlotte in a fashion never before seen by us in the series. It's incredibly uncomfortable, but it's also the most human this one-time god among men has ever appeared to us. Even after the fact, he feels hollow and alone, left holding himself distraught. It's an effective scene for all the reasons I outlined, but to add further layers to this outcome, as touched on prior, this scene is also a terrific contrast that brings the best out of what transpires between Guts and Casca. With Griffith's relationship with Charlotte being born out of manipulation, leverage, and ambition, Guts and Casca's develop naturally across the entire arc. He encounters her even before he does Griffith, and I don't think there's a single person Guts himself interacts with more in significant ways. Maybe Judo is a close candidate, but even then, that's mostly light conversation. Unlike Griffith, who sought out Charlotte for his own selfish desires, after having left for a long time, Guts returns into Casca's life not for personal indulgence, but instead Instead, to make a save in grand fashion. He learns of all the hardships she's had to endure and how strong she's been for everyone involved. This is a far cry from Griffith's scene with Charlotte and the differences only pile up as the story progresses. Where Griffith barely spoke to Charlotte, even cutting her off mid-sentence with an unsolicited kiss, Guts and Casca work through their remaining differences and baggage together in one of the most beautifully vulnerable and powerful scenes so far in the story. Metaphorically laying themselves bare before each other, this is what genuine connection looks like, and it's exactly what Guts has been looking for all story long. And during this waterfall scene, there's a specific moment where we as an audience finally see the toll this past year has had on Casca's psyche, and we see the state the Band of the Hawk has been reduced to. And from the deepest despair, Guts himself helps to uplift her from this courageous, self-imposed prison. And in no greater contrast to Griffith, instead of forcing himself on her, he gently and slowly comforts her, naturally leading to their first kiss. It's a gorgeous marriage of narrative competence and masterful layout work. Right here, if the story ended, I would have been happy. But it didn't. The rescue of Griffith, courtesy of the best the Band of the Hawk has to offer, is such a thrilling and anxious affair. There are so many different plot threads dangling in the air with some stupendously subtle paneling implemented to foreshadow future events that I could hardly contain myself throughout my reading. Furthermore, I really appreciate how this ragtag team of rescuers are incredibly proficient. Faced with scenarios that are far more complex than we've ever seen before, I love how everyone from Guts to Casca to Judo to even Pippin find their means of contribution towards this final effort which will no doubt make what happens after all the more shocking and sorrowful. Again, continuing to implement the techniques spoken on prior, Miura places our heroes in situations they've never before seen the likes of. Having to sneak into one of the darkest, most depressing environments we've collectively encountered, the band have to make their way down to the cellar where Griffith has been kept all this time as punishment for violating the princess. Apart from the horrific imagery on display during this segment, something that's particularly impressive, I think, here was this page. This is a wonderful misdirection for the readers. Given the candor displayed by Guts and the rest of the band, it seemed to me upon first read through that this was a tender moment displaying two friends reuniting and showing their appreciation for each other. However, upon closer inspection, and now armed with the knowledge of what's to come, we can notice that unlike Guts, Griffith wasn't crying and that he in fact wasn't trying to hug him, but was trying to strangle him. When we as people are pushed to the brink, our true nature is presented and this remains true here with Griffith showing us exactly who he is. I think it's also kind of interesting how, as I mentioned in the previous video, Guts' security blanket is in many ways his sword, and think there's an interesting contrast here. Later in the story, Griffith has a moment where he's talking to himself about what he's done for Guts and the dangers he's put himself in to protect him, which made me think, Guts was Griffith's security blanket, and as soon as he lost him, he felt as if he had no control over the world anymore, like he lost a fundamental part of himself. In other words, he was put under pressure, and he couldn't take it. In many ways, the protagonist of this story can only be as intellectually fascinating or emotionally compelling as the forces of antagonism make him. In other words, a great hero can only be as good as the forces of evil he's up against. And what I find so interesting about that particular idea is the means with which Miura understood this rule and chose to build upon it. The strength of a story like Berserk is that it isn't restrained by the limitations of other manga narratives targeted towards different demographics 
graphics. Due to this fact, Miura is free to make something look as beautiful or as horrifying as he can possibly imagine, taking comparable elements like these two sex scenes I spoke on earlier, making one of them appear beautiful, elegant, and freeing, with this initial scene between Guts and Casca showing us everything great that can happen from an outing like this, and at the end of the arc, some of the absolute worst. In a way, Berserk shows us the very best and the absolute worst of human nature, and the story is all the more powerful for it. This allows him to create those extreme pressures for various characters I told you about earlier, and as a result, makes our heroes appear that much more legendary and virtuous, while making the antagonists all the more underhanded and despicable, making for heavenly high highs and soul-destroying lows. Berserk is a manga of extremes, with the arc's beginning feeling extremely grounded, but as the story trudges onward, the more fantastical elements make themselves known gradually over time. This is all to say that the characters of Berserk and the world of Berserk serve to make this one of the most emotionally resonant stories out there. If these techniques I've illuminated were created to help grab a viewer's attention, then the extremes Berserk employs serves to shackle the reader's attention to the pages as they flutter by seamlessly. Nosferatu Zod and the Battle of Doldry. Last week, I neglected to speak on the events of the Battle of Doldry for a number of reasons. I don't like to dwell too much on heavy action set pieces as they are a feast for the eyes, but not always for the mind. With that taken into consideration, however, the Battle of Doldry gave me more than a little to consider and sink my teeth into, particularly now that I've finished the arc and have the benefit of hindsight. Throughout this story, Guts has been a man akin to Hercules, otherworldly strength, tenacious understanding, and he never seems to reach his limits. This has been helped on numerous occasions by by the circumstances he not only is placed in, but manages to crawl out of. We've seen him defeat monsters, demons, and even armies of men, all trying their very best to take him down, but none ever have. But one almost did. And it wasn't a monster, or a demon, or an army. It was a single man. During Guts's impressive physical display, there is one instance where, for lack of a better term, or way of describing it, he was supposed to die. That had it not been for one specific character, Nosferatu Zod, Guts wouldn't be here. Zod makes his presence felt numerous times throughout this arc and always in a pivotal sense. In a way, Zod seems at the very least morbidly interested in Guts. For what reason I can't be certain, but he is interested in him nevertheless. Perhaps similar to how Hisoka treats many of the main cast early on in Hunter x Hunter. Bungie gum contains the properties of both rubber and gum. Zod seems to be interested in preserving the likes of Guts, for during the moment he was about to die, he threw him the weapon he needed to survive. At that moment, he was conflicting with our idea of him as a character. In our minds, we view him as the bad guy, and now he's preserving the life of the hero character. But knowing what I know now, it almost seems as though this was one of the worst things he could have ever done for this young man. Given his talk of the Eclipse, which I will definitely speak on in just a sec, he seems to be involved in this idea of preordained destiny. He will ensure that Guts will make it to the Eclipse, and once branded, it's only a matter of time before he, Guts, will lose his life. In many ways, Zod not only prolongs Guts's life, but ensures it down a specific path that he's interested in, and it highlighted just how vulnerable and human the character of Guts actually is, making his character that much more effective. The Eclipse. It's going to be very difficult for me to say something concerning this aspect of the story beyond what many before me already have and to a much better degree. I haven't studied this arc the same way many people have and these are really just my first impressions. But personally, I found this to be a stunningly beautiful affair in terms of artwork while also being one of the most difficult sections of storytelling I've ever, and I mean this, sat through in my life. And it's by design. While reading this, I felt really uncomfortable. However, in that same breath, I cheered Guts on as much as I could. This eclipse had been an event we've effectively been counting down towards since it was first mentioned. The link was made with that weird necklace egg thing Griffith had, and really, I had been waiting to see what sort of twisted and sadistic circumstances Griffith would put Guts through to create that same level of hatred he demonstrated at the end of the Black Swordsman arc. And by the way, those of you that say the Black Swordsman arc is unnecessary, I think, are dead wrong. The arc sets 
up the lens through which we are expected to see this arc. Going into Golden Age, we know how it's going to end, and the arc is written to cater to that viewpoint specifically. Skipping Black Swordsman is, in my opinion, a significantly worsened experience and certainly not inconsequential. Going into this arc, in the back of my mind, I was on the defensive, trying to prevent the story from making me care about these characters because I knew there was going to come a moment where Guts would be alone and filled with the same resentment and vengeance we previously saw him with. But I didn't succeed in that venture because that's exactly what this arc tricks you into doing. It tricks you into caring. Much like Guts is as a character, we as an audience after Black Swordsman have our guards up, on alert against the outcome we know is coming, but over the course of this sprawling epic, one after another, our walls come tumbling down as we learn to embrace and hope for the future with Guts and his new team of friends. We learn to love Pippin's good nature, Judo's sharp and considerate thinking, Corcus's abrasive antics, Casca's strength and compassion, and even maybe for a moment or two, Griffith's determination. Like Guts, we had our guard up against the evil that we knew was coming, and yet Miura found a way to help us warm to this, at times, overwhelmingly cold world. Through this lovable group, the same way Guts did, learning about their pain, their struggles, and the sacrifices they've been either forced to make or have been apprehensively made when all other options had been taken away from them. Miura created a world, populated it with some of the most human characters we've ever seen, and in leveraging that which we cared for, he gave us exactly what he'd made us hope never would manifest. He flooded this human world with demons. Any sense of stability, hope, and happiness that was once present is now immediately extinguished in the most excruciating of ways. The pressures these characters have been placed under has been perhaps greater than any we've seen. During this, we see who these people really are for the better and for the worse. The term bad dream is mentioned numerous times during this particular apocalyptic scenario, and I think it's as if to reinforce the success of Griffith achieving his lifelong dream, with it effectively being everyone's collective nightmare. Throughout Bizarre Guts has been depicted as a fallible, flawed, troubled, but immeasurably resilient individual capable of feats of strength and tenacity far greater than anyone ever expected from him. The trend throughout this story has placed him under tremendous pressure time and again, forcing him to place his life on the line against impossible odds, showing us that he truly is a powerful, heroic, and virtuous person. Reinforcing this idea that as long as he's armed, he's practically invincible in combat. And so, instead of continuing that trend, Miura decides to subvert this very aspect of him during the Eclipse. In this, Miura asks the question, what if Guts can't save them? What if Guts fails? Casted into a literal hellscape vortex of which there is virtually no escape, the paneling once again is some of the best in the industry, but perhaps some of the very best out of Miura himself. There's a real sense of scale and horror to these moments, helping to emphasize some of the more tender exchanges as the main group slowly whittle away to nothing. Pippin's send-off broke my heart as he stayed back to hold them off, only for us to see him fall in the distance. Corcus's too was nightmarish to a horrifying degree, but Judo's honestly took me by surprise, and because of that, it hit me like a train. Watching as he time and again does everything in his limited power to struggle and protect Casca, only to, on his deathbed reveal to us as readers, he in fact always had feelings for her and made me tear up beyond belief. And with everyone dead, Casca captured and Guts struggling and crawling to her rescue, once again Miura puts us and Guts through hell. <laughs> For almost two entire chapters, we're forced to watch, powerless to do anything, as the person Guts loves more than anyone in the world endures some of the worst abuse I've ever been able to see or think of. With the artwork capturing how Guts felt more accurately than I ever could possibly describe, thanks to Miura's masterful implementation of a calligraphy brush. Hacking his arm off and piercing his eye trying to get free, unable to change anything, page after page, this kept on going relentlessly. So much so, I had to step away from the story after witnessing it. But upon my return a day or two later, the worst part came into focus for me. For once the eclipse came to a close, Griffith rose to power as some sort of dark phoenix satanic demigod and Skull Knight saved both Guts and Casca, the story and torture, in a sense, continues. Destiny. 
there seems to be an interesting push to empower the idea of destiny in some shape or form within this story. Time and again, noteworthy events occur as Puck and Guts, without even knowing each other, indirectly intersect. Here's an example. Early in the story, Judo tells Casca about the elf he met in those days when he was working with a traveling entertainment troupe. We of course know who he's talking about, but within this conversation, he gives Casca this elf or fairy dust that ends up healing Guts' wounds after he managed to take out 100 men. This link could have ended here as a very nice cameo, but later in the story, during the events of the Eclipse, we actually get to see Puck cross paths with Rickert. So I wonder, is this relationship between Guts and Puck destined to happen? Are their fates intertwined in some sort of meaningful way? What is Miura trying to tell me here? Because we later see Rickert meeting with Guts again, and as it is said in this troop scene, he's going to be important in later events. There are some other subtle details like Guts crossing paths with a as he is the apostle who ends up killing Pippin during the eclipse, but this whole destiny concept gets much more present towards the conclusion of the arc, where Skull Knight and the demons tell Guts explicitly that he is branded and will be forever haunted as a result. And in this moment, Guts fiercely declares war against his own destiny, as he believes he's the one who blazes his own path, even when the circumstances point to everything other than that being the reality. Which is sort of ironic because Guts is forced to follow this path that seems to be already decided by destiny, he is healed by the elf dust, both Zod and Skull Knight save his life in situations where he should have died, and most importantly, he crosses paths with Griffith. And Griffith specifically, because it is said by both humans and demons that he is someone special. And we see this at the end of the eclipse. Guts falls into a pit that seems bottomless while Griffith rises from the ashes like some sort of primordial phoenix, as he embraces his true nature and his decisive victory in this finale. It's like Griffith was favored by destiny from the beginning, while Guts wasn't. Griffith has everything in his hands to achieve his goals and dreams while Guts has nothing other than his sword. Griffith is allowed to dream while Guts is cursed to struggle. The Aftermath Having been the only person to survive that ordeal and come out relatively unscathed, Guts experiences the isolation and loneliness that comes with the strength and resilience he possesses. For the duration of this arc, as things began to get better and better for our main troop, one of my favourite aspects has to be the relationship between Guts and his team, but more specifically, Casca. Their relationship throughout was spectacular and felt extremely real, and as the looming end came ever closer, I couldn't ignore that I knew what was going to happen. At the end of the Black Swordsman arc, I knew knew Griffith would be someone he hated more than anyone and I knew he was alone. And so as people died in grand but horrific fashion, I was faced with something while gruesome was also something I had anticipated. A while back on my Twitter, I shared some thoughts I had regarding this series, saying that I wish that things would have stayed as they were. I tweeted this having been convinced that Casca would die at the end of the story along with the rest of them, but in reality something, at least for now, far worse has happened. The worst thing for Guts wasn't for Casca necessarily to die, but for her to go on in this tortured, tortured state she's left in. And in learning how he has to constantly keep finding a reason to live and fight not only was beautiful, but tied once again back with that quote Griffith threw out towards the middle of the arc. Guts now, well, he has a goal. To survive and to fight Griffith, body and soul. Before I go, Numerous messages I received after I announced I would be tackling this series claimed that I would find its contents too grim, much the same as I did with Hunter Hunter during my read-through of that. Many of those that messaged me said I would find more of the same here. And going into this series, I was very conscious of that being a distinct possibility. But what Berserk revealed to me wasn't unrelenting depression, but instead quite the opposite. Behind the gore, violence, torture, and agony many in this story have to endure resides a tale rich with hope and love. Begging for someone, any one of us, to just hold on that little bit longer. To keep fighting, to keep crawling, to keep struggling towards a brighter future. It's one of the most touching narratives I've ever had the pleasure of reading and I can't recommend this story to anyone out there enough. Berserk's sophomore outing in the Golden Age arc receives the highest praise I think I can give a story. I'm excited to read it again and again and again. If you haven't yet read it, consider yourself one of the lucky ones because you have ahead of yourself the possibility of enjoying something that I think comes around only once in a lifetime. So if you can, go grab yourself the work of potentially the greatest mangaka to have ever lived, Kentaro Miura. And let's struggle through this incredible tale of loss, love, despair, and happiness as we make our way into the Conviction Arc.
The Lost Children arc is a story unlike any other contained within Berserk. In most other sections of this sprawling tragedy, Miura allows us to view Guts as the backbone of each part. However, in this, Guts isn't the backbone, and I wouldn't even say he's the main protagonist. In fact, speaking specifically about the foundations of this arc, no one character fulfills that role in my view. But instead, what anchors this narrative is a fairy tale of sorts, a piece of folklore that brings with it an interesting angle for which to view this story through. So I think in order to understand this arc, you must first understand its fairy tale. Peacalf the Outcast. Something that came as a shock to me while I was reading this was how similar the structure was to one of my favorite One Piece arcs, Skypiea. I'm not going to spoil the story of Skypiea, but one aspect that these two stories share is the legend or fairy tale present in their respective stories, which dictates what happens later, either thematically or literally. In the case of One Piece, it's the story of Noland, and in the case of Lost Children, it's the tale of Peacalf the Outcast. Occupying roughly two and a half pages in the entire arc, Peacalf's story tells the tale of a young village boy with with two loving parents. However, sporting two pointy ears and red eyes, he finds himself alienated from the rest of his community, routinely bullied by the other children. One night, however, in search of his real family, Peacalf ran into the forest looking for where the elves lived, where grown-ups never said to go. Eventually, he found the elves, but not the family he was seeking. Peacalf didn't have wings and was honestly quite different to the elves he sought community with. They did, however, tell him that one night, many, many years ago, a mother and father ventured into the woods to save their sick child. They managed to save him with their magic, but in exchange changed his appearance to half resemble that of the elves. Learning this, with great haste, he ran off back to the village only to find that 100 years had passed in the moments he was away. Left alone, Peacalf the outcast cried and cried, his red eyes swollen even redder. The moral of the story is simple to understand in isolation, but it's how Miura leverages this story and explores its themes and potential messaging in this broader story with two of its key characters. Jill, a young girl rescued at the beginning by Guts, and eventually another young girl called Rosine. One of the first things you'll notice in this story is how different it feels from all the others, and it achieves this through Guts's relinquishing his position as the main character. Instead, placed in this role is the young girl with a troubled family situation called Jill. And the reason I see her as the main character is that there are large portions of it told through her point of view specifically. For instance, there's a tremendous amount of narration surrounding Jill and Guts's first meeting when he rescues her from some bandits and kidnappers. Already, this sets a different tone, but what really makes this strange is how he's often referred to as the Black Swordsman, or just Swordsman, instead of Guts his name. With this very introduction, she has two Guts framed as our own to the character also. In another scene, after Guts brings her home, he's shown a quiet place to rest, but when we return to that scene the next morning, we find that we didn't spend the night with him, and instead, Jill. It's her point of view and story that this tale is concerned with. We return to Guts having clearly spent a night fighting monsters only for Jill to stumble upon the aftermath. Jill is her point of view character. Guts is just the catalyst for the chaos that ensues immediately after this moment when we get the first meeting between the two main characters, the protagonist Jill and the antagonist Rosine. Interestingly, and in keeping with the story doing things just a little bit different, instead of Guts being held responsible for the action taking place in this arc, it's Puck and his elven appearance that's held responsible. And the reason is obviously this girl I've been talking about called Rosine. Oh, and by the way, did I mention that she's a weird moth monster? This is one of the two antagonists of the arc and one of the most important elements of the story to our main protagonist in Jill. And I'd like to talk about why this is cool now, but instead, right in the middle of the story, we get this weird one-shot chapter called The Prototype in the hardback deluxe edition I'm reading. Berserk the Prototype. This story is a submission piece created by Kentaro Miura during his stay in college in 1988, which became his basis for what is now called the series Berserk. The establishment of certain details, worldview, and whatnot differs at points from the Berserk series that was later published, but the intent is still present in this early incarnation. The most noticeable difference right away is how much looser an art style the pages and characters are drawn with. It still looks like Berserk, but with a greater emphasis on expression over the detail he would become later known for. However, in addition to that, this manga carries with it a great sin. One which I, I don't think I can forgive. For when Guts is requested by an old woman to avenge her granddaughter, he refuses in a way that makes my very skin crawl. Confidently, he responds, I've got nothing to do with just and generous chivalry. I could care less. I can't believe you've done this. 
To borrow a quote from David Mitchell, I could care less is absolutely useless as an indicator of how much you care because the only thing that it rules out is that you don't care at all, which is exactly what you're trying to convey. And let's be clear here for one moment. I don't blame Miura for a second, but I do blame whoever localized the version I'm reading into English. Translation is a tough business, I'm sure, but one thing I'm supposed to be able to take for granted when someone translates into English is that they know how to speak fucking English. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. And now I'm realizing that I've spoken about literally one tiny line more than the chapter itself. In broad strokes, this chapter, while having a few details changed here and there, highlights how much of the story Miura was settled on even before the story began. Brandings, the design of which is only minorly changed, his appearance, and the eclipse over the castle. A shot that is etched into my mind so deep, I'm convinced years of therapy won't remove it. And of course, the character of Puck. The flavor of Berserk is very clearly present, as well as Miura's approach with Guts as a character. Being a selfish guy that's pretty bad at being selfish. Decent chapter overall, nothing groundbreaking, but if you're a fan of the series, you will absolutely get a kick out of this. And now back to the main story. In the past, Miura has described this story and the broader conviction arc as a Sekaike or world type story. The simple definition of a Sekaike story is the existence of a close relationship between two people, which turns out to be the sole driving force of the events up to and including having all other happenings in the world at large depending on said relationship's fate, whether metaphorically or literally. Within the broader conviction arc, Miura is obviously alluding to the relationship between Guts and Puck, which too plays a massive role in these events surrounding Lost Children, particularly the ending. But the relationship in question that influences the path of Lost Children specifically is that which exists between the characters of Jill, our protagonist, and Rosine, her friend, and the antagonist of this story. Something Miura does a fantastic job of with this chapter is managing the audience's expectations. We're made aware of everyone's biases, experiences, and how their perception of the character Guts changes and morphs over the narrative. And it's most effective when we finally see the image of the children, now corpses in a burning barn after changing back once they die at the hands of Guts. Worth noting here though is that they actually attacked him first. They weren't children and were in fact monster bug creatures embodied with the spirit of children lost from the village. But try telling that to the parents. They see a pile of child corpses and all of a sudden everyone's up in arms. It's very like Kentaro Miura to really hammer home just how bad a situation is by making it stand beside significantly less harrowing material. I mean there's a page during the chapter entitled Red Eye Peak where in a small fire, a child reaches out to Guts asking for his mommy and Guts just cleaves this young guy in twain. Like, it's really brutal stuff, but it comes immediately after seeing a heart-to-heart -heart with Jill and Puck following close behind him. Jill's recanting of a backstory concerning her one-time friend Rosine, however, is interesting for a number of reasons. I really like how these brief moments of reflection add more color to this already black world, making it feel all the more lived in, but when she brings up the behel that Rosine found, my mind began to wonder. Those those things seem to seek out those that are in tremendous pain or perhaps individuals with promise. Certainly not the same level of promise Griffith had, but it did give me a moment for pause. This rogue elf creature is in fact Rosine after all, and she fell to the Behelet, which means there's reason to believe that the person she was once still resides somewhere deep down, as she yielded her attack once Jill placed herself in between Guts and herself. Making me stop to think for a second, I wonder if the person Griffith is is still there, and if he is, is it someone that would have compassion for anyone? Is anything more important to him than his current conquest. My guess would be no, but who's to say for sure? I have no idea what's to come in the story. I want to keep this section brief as it's sort of an aside to the main focus of this story, instead picking up on the broader significance of certain aspects that came to my attention while reading this arc. Concerning the character of Rosine, she seems to have appeared during the eclipse in front of Rickard, which creates, I suppose, a natural segue into me pointing out my acknowledgement of other apostles that have appeared in other arcs, like the Snake Man from Chapter 1, the Troubled Count from the end of the Black Swordsman arc, and of course, the apostle that killed Corcus. It was the one Guts obliterated in the very first pages of both one. Oh, and by the way, I'd like to thank the commenter that pointed that out to us a while back. We definitely would have missed that had you not pointed that out to us, so thank you. Additionally, and perhaps most importantly concerning the present story we're exploring in this video, something happens between Guts and Pup that's perhaps the most overt and explicit example of there being a fate that's drawing them towards each other. Having had a falling out and going their separate ways part ways through the midpoint of this arc, Puck, seemingly without his knowledge, is drawn back inadvertently to the area Guts is heading, the Misty Valley. 
where Rosine has brought Jill. I still don't fully understand what this means in the long term, but it's definitely interesting to see how it might develop. And with Jill now having been kidnapped and taken by Rosine into her land of the elves in this misty valley, Guts is slaughtering his way to Rosine without her knowledge. There's a collision course after being set, so let's discuss the climax and the ending of this arc. The Lost Children arc is a story about coping with trauma. Jill and Rosine, two young girls and in many ways are point of view antagonists and protagonists of the arc, unlike previous arcs in this story, Guts is seen less like the central character and in reality more like the opposing force of antagonism to the events that transpire. It's honestly fascinating. And yet, the paradise Rosine creates for herself turns into a flaming hellscape. In this climax, the action is insane, the visuals are ridiculously beautiful and harrowing, and Guts really brings the intensity. And he is very much the pressure onto the evil in this story, but in the end, he reveals that he isn't the answer that Jill is looking for. The salvation she desires from the torment of her upbringing. She confides in him and wants to escape with him anywhere else, but he reveals to her that his battlefield isn't any better, and that she too should return to her own. In this story, it brings to the forefront of our minds, sometimes you can't be happy. Sometimes there are no happy endings. Sometimes all we can do is continue to struggle and fight. He disappeared into the darkness, and in the end, I still didn't know who he was. Just like when he appeared, he took the demons away. I was the only one left behind. I still don't really know what these past days of fear, sadness, and shock were to me. The mist cleared away. The mist that would never go away was pushed out by the flames. The clear sky now peeks through. But it's by no means a spectacle that makes my heart leap, like when I flew in the sky with Rosine. It's... savage. Lonely. Cold. But... such a vivid sky. It's a clear sky, like the kind after a storm blows through. I don't have wings, so I guess I'll look up at the sky and crawl along the earth. Maybe I can change something. The poetry in Lost Children's closing chapters are a poignant and bittersweet reminder that while well comfort can be found in fantasy and delusion, the clear, vivid, and real skies we seek so desperately in life come at the expense of what we thought it was we wanted. Sometimes your most desperate dreams are destined to be just that, but you have a choice. To exist in the real world and appreciate what you have when you have it, or to lose yourself like Rosine in the delusions and desires she had for the impossible. In this arc, Miura really does explore themes of escapism through delusion. The story of Rosine is one of tragedy, and so too is Jill's a tale of tragedy with one discernible difference. Jill's tragedy is one of possibility, one that contains hope for the future. And in the end, if Berserk has taught me anything, it's that while things can get worse, they can also get much better and that alone is worth struggling for. Both Rosine and Jill seek ways to escape their realities, burdened with a feeling of not belonging, having grown up in families they don't feel a connection with. Both Rosine and Jill see themselves as Picaf in his tale and their respective journeys reflect his actions in that children's story, but in slightly different ways. Ways that explore the messaging of this arc in an intensely effective fashion. Rosine creates her nightmarish paradise filled with the fake friends and guardians she was denied as a child, while Jill asks Guts to take her to look for another paradise once the action and events subside. In both cases, Guts is the one who gives them their respective reality checks. Firstly, by killing Rosine and forcing her to see what is real. And secondly, by showing Jill the reality of what she's asking for. The nightmarish demons that haunt him every single night. There is no paradise. Only battlefields. And by accepting reality, Jill ends up seeking her own way to confront her own life's numerous obstacles and her own destiny the same way Guts does. For a manga so rife with conflict and grotesque acts of violence and misconduct, the Berserk series has surprised me by reliably providing some of the most perfectly poetic moments like Guts' heart to heart with Jill at the end. There is no paradise for you to escape to. What's there is just a battlefield. Another friendly reminder that even the most powerful or monstrous among us face struggles only they can fully appreciate and understand. And that we are all in one way or another struggling 
our own way through life. It should go without saying at this point that Kentaro Miura is a league into and of his own when it comes to the condition of his layouts and the presentation given to these stories he so feverishly lavished with his deepest considerations. Rosine's death is an absolute highlight from this section and another reminder that while he's immensely talented at depicting some of the most horrific tragedies one can conjure in their mind, is also able to elicit an ethereal and otherworldly tragic beauty also. I took a slightly different direction with this arc and I thought the inclusion of a fairy tale in this story was an interesting angle for which to tackle the material. And to be clear, this is the main reason why the more bombastic aspects of the story, like the fight with Guts and the bandits that were later turned into insects, or details like Rosine having already shown off her control over bug demons in the Golden Age arc, didn't take the main focus of this video. And speaking of Guts and Rosine, the final bout between the two of them is brutally fantastic, but as you know, the element that always receives the main focus from me is the story. Storytelling over action. And because we are now out of material that has a companion anime, my editor now only has manga panels for which to create visuals and thus, making these videos has become a much, much more time consuming effort. And pretty much like I did last time with the character of Zod, I'm saving my thoughts on the Holy Iron Chain Knights for the second part of the Conviction Tale, as I have a feeling we're gonna see much more of them later in the story. But in closing, if you haven't read Berserk yet, please do so. It's honestly a story unlike any I've read. This was only part one of this arc, and let me tell you, I was not prepared for what the rest of the Conviction arc had in store. This arc contains within it not only the best chapter I've read from Berserk, but perhaps the single greatest chapter, or most impactful, I've read in my life. While Lost Children felt like a brief de-wriggling of the main story, the Conviction arc as a whole contains within it not only a fascinating continuation of the story, but some harsh truths and tough subject matter the likes of which I've seldom seen explored in this medium, and certainly nowhere near as tactfully executed. This arc is a special one and I want to do it justice. Normally when I tackle a series on my channel, I immerse myself into the material wholly and entirely until such time it's finished. One Piece, almost six months of nothing but One Piece on my channel. Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, only Jojo for months and months. And the same can be said for Dragon Ball and even Hunter x Hunter. But Berserk is the first series I've done where after every video I'm forced to take a break for almost a full month between sessions of reading. This is for logistical reasons as we can't feasibly make videos using only manga week in and week out. But in turn, this created for me a relationship with this story that I honestly couldn't have predicted. A reaction that with any other manga would have conjured a resentful disaster. Having to constantly pull myself from material I'm outwardly enjoying like Naruto and Dragon Ball for the express purpose of reacquainting myself with this very dense and emotionally draining series. It seems like it would be a recipe for disaster. And thus was the mindset I found myself to be in every single time I have to tackle this berserk series. And I won't deny this. I want to be honest, it's a series that over the last few months has forced me to stay off balance as I switch from the comparably softer and easier to understand material to child murder and complicated thematic and symbolic orchestrations from a master of his craft. It's a lot of work, but every single time I grumpily pick up these volumes for the purposes of making a video, and yet every single time they, without exception, never allow me to put them down. They are some of the best conceived works, not only of a manga, but art that I've ever been exposed to. It's like the movie Fifty First Dates, only instead of Adam Sandler, Berserk forces me to fall in love with it every single time. And so, I guess what I'm trying to say is, Berserk is the 51st dates of manga. And on this occasion, I was confronted by an arc that reduced me to tears, and a chapter that shook my very soul. And unlike the previous Berserk reviews, after finishing this arc, I decided to research a bit before I began writing this time. Apparently, the Conviction arc is broken up into three separate sections. Lost Children, which I covered last week, Binding Chain, and finally, Birth Ceremony. The latter two will of course receive the vast majority of the focus in this video, but through my research, I learned that quite a few people don't like lost children, which was interesting to me, but I think it's understandable. Allow me to explain my impressions of this divide and where I think they stem from. 
The Black Swordsman arc I covered in my very first video was unanimously seen as a decent start with stunning visuals despite it being a rather unremarkable start that would eventually build up more steam towards its conclusion. Similarly, through my coverage of the Golden Age arc, I recognized an almost global acknowledgement of the story's masterpiece status amongst manga, from both fans of the material to even those that never even read Berserk in their lives. However, Lost Children was different. There was no such unanimous agreements. There were those that loved it, those that believed it was sort of overrated, and those that straight up did not enjoy this section at all. And while I stand by my assessment of the story in my last review, that being I really, really liked it, to put it simply, I also concede that I believe I know where those sentiments of negativity are stemming from. Golden Age is a much more standard format for a story, with a fully conceived narrative that follows the life of one central character primarily and his relationships with other key characters as he grows into the man we see today. It's very much a coming of age story, not at all unusual. Because of this we grow a fondness for this experience and once it ends we want to see it continue. And unfortunately Lost Children didn't offer an experience that many were yearning for after Golden Age. Despite it being an account that followed the events of Golden Age and Black Swordsman arcs respectively, Miura decided not to tell a story that primarily concerned itself with Guts, but instead a little girl called Jill. Guts plays a substantial role, but certainly not the central position, instead acting more of a supporting character in the central plot, thus resulting in lost children feeling a little more like a detour after Golden Age's epic adventures rather than the continuation of a lot of people wanted. Personally, I viewed Lost Children as a much needed break from the torment that was the conclusion of the Golden Age arc, and I also found it to be a sound thematic continuation of the series for sure. However, I can absolutely see why this wasn't what a lot of people wanted. Conviction Arc during this portion of the story, it became clear relatively quickly that the main storyline that took a break after the Golden Age was once again picking itself right back up. During the events of Lost Children, we were introduced to this impending religious force known as the Holy Iron Chain Knights as one of the forces on a mission pursuing and capturing the Black Swordsmen. And boy, do they do just that. Despite the high death toll of their forces, a new character by the name of Lady Farnese, and boy do I have a lot to say about this girl, she secures one of the few victories over Guts in the series, much to my amazement. There are, of course, a host of caveats to this chance encounter, but it's compelling nevertheless, keeping me guessing the entire time as to how Guts would escape this exhausting situation, and in the end, the answer was, he couldn't. He was too beat up. And as a quick aside, one aspect of this story that immediately caught my attention was its cast. The story goes hard in the character department, and it's all for the best, let me tell you. There's the troubled commander of the Holy Iron Chain Knights and religious devotee, Lady Farnies, her devout protector and all-around lovable bad badass in Serpico, the horrifyingly accurate depiction of all of religion's worst qualities in Father Mosgus, and many, many more, some of which I'll touch on later for sure. I loved every single character in this arc, and I mean that without reservation. I've no idea what the consensus is with characters like Isidro or Nina later on who are designed to, I think, be a bit more divisive, but from an entertainment and thematic standpoint, I found them to be pitch perfect. However, it's during this time spent as a prisoner and after escaping that I soon began to recognize perhaps a parallel that Miura was trying to illustrate for me. Lady Farnes is one of the few main characters that stood out among the Holy Iron Chain Knights, with her being the main character of conflict for Guts as well as his eventual hostage once he escapes. She's complicated and in many ways horrible to our main cast, full of contradictions both professionally and emotionally. Physically and mentally weak, yet commander of her forces thanks to her father, espouses to the virtues of dignity, duty, restraint and kindness, and yet relentlessly lashes out to others with the smallest infraction, oftentimes with resentful or envious motivations. Confidently religious, but hedonistic and confused. She's one of the most frustrating characters in the story, fundamentally flawed as a person and one that plays a leading role receiving I think the most development by far in this tale. And I absolutely hated her for most of it, but god Damn it, she's a brilliant character. Now, the only reason I found it noteworthy to mention her contributions this early in the arc was due to the symbolic or nostalgic nature of them. She reminded me in some ways of Casca, and okay, okay, I know what you're thinking, but hear me out for a second. For Casca, Griffith may as well have been her religion. She devoted her life to him, and when it came down to choosing between him and another, she saw it sort of like a sin, almost going as far as to kill herself. In fact, she tried to. 
There are, of course, a number of key differences between these characters, but given that following Lady Farnese's possession, which has very similar undertones and results, by the way, we're immediately thrown back into contact with Casca's storyline, and due to that, I couldn't help but feel like this was an intentional comparison being drawn on behalf of Miura. Oh, and by the way, with this jump to Casca's storyline, almost linking these two points of view, we see a shared dream? It's honestly hard to know. It's three pages and it depicts forces that make themselves known later on in the story upon its conclusion. Massive beasts, death, sickness, desperation, and a white shining falcon in the middle of it all. A falcon that is shown as the desire of this portrayed world. I'm not sure in retrospective if this was an omen predicting what's in store during this arc or the next, but Lord knows almost all of these come to fruition during this portion of the story or its latter half, which oddly enough made me think about the name of this arc. Conviction is an interesting name for this story and one that I didn't fully appreciate until such time this part of the story rolled around. Given the state of Guts, how far gone he is, and how the entire world seems to be in some shape or form interested in his capture, I saw this arc's title as an indication that he'll be captured and in this story ultimately convicted. And while that does happen in some shape or form in this series, the tale itself is more concerned with the alternate meaning of the term conviction, which is a firmly held belief in something. And that brings me nicely to my favourite chapter following Guts's first time returning to Rickert, Godo, and Casca in two years. Cracks in the Blade. Cracks in the Blade sits alongside Campfire of Dreams as another one of the chapters that stand out in my head as not just brilliantly panelled, but intensely profound. Taking what we thought were known motivations of the main character and turning them completely on their head. In Campfire of Dreams, it was his acknowledgement that despite being among friends and there being a home for him there, he never felt more alienated from those around him, reminding him that he needs to find his own dream, his own desires, his own convictions. And within Cracks in the Blade, we finally get an answer to that question posed during Campfire of Dreams and with it yet another masterful recontextualization of events from Miura. Just like Campfire, Crax's most pivotal moments center around two people sharing insight, having a heart-to-heart, -heart, one reflecting on lessons he learned in his life and another about to make the same mistake. However, unlike Campfire, Crax's subject matter and philosophical profundity casts a much broader net than just within the arc it's presented, and in fact caused me to reflect on the broader story and even certain decisions I've made in my life. It's a chapter that works frankly as well as it does because those that are reading it need to hear it, given most who read this manga are of similar age to that of Guts or at least a little bit older. And I can't say many stories have had that sort of impact on me. Shining a light on the selfish decision Guts made to go out into the world, to leave Casca alone and to embrace the hatred in his heart, exacting his revenge on the monsters that took everything from him. These are traits often glorified in manga, however with Berserk, Godo effectively calls Guts a coward that couldn't look sorrow, in this case Casca, in the eye without wavering. Someone who took the easy way out rather than confront the problems and prioritize. The god, the Herculean figure that Guts has been made out to be, due to the feats he's enacted on those he's hated, now feeds into the narrative that these are all acts of cowardice. And it's a brilliant way to look at this particular problem. And as a result of that now, he's beaten himself to near death and Casca has run off somewhere, presumably dead, yielding massive consequences for this arc and its trajectory moving forward. This is exactly the sort of cause and effect I was looking for from this story following the Golden Age, and it's another example of a narrative decision made by Miura to further bolster his claim to the title, Greatest Mangaka to Have Ever Lived. And I stand by that. But honestly, I'm struggling to find the words to effectively describe just how steeped in philosophy and carefully curated encounters the first half of this section is. Taken into the context of the current material, all of the criticisms of Lost Children, a story I once described as a fairy tale of sorts, echoes the criticisms Godo had for Guts in the Cracks in the Blade chapter, claiming that he was indulging in a fantasy, instead of the reality being there for those that he cared about. One of the many markers I think of a great story is its ability to recontextualize prior events and lend greater weight to them via new material, One Piece does this to great effect, and I'm seeing it right here too in Berserk, time and time again. 
Let's talk about Behelitz and how they've affected this story while staying in line with the theme of this arc, bravery in the face of indulgent fantasy. In the Black Swordsman arc, the Count exacerbated the situation he was in when he wasn't capable of dealing with the horrible fate that befell his wife. In the Golden Age, Griffith lost himself in his own fantasy, which in turn made his journey that much longer, ignoring himself for the sake of one other person that in the end he couldn't control. In Lost Children, Rosine couldn't deal with her own personal life, so she escaped by killing her family and created her own paradise, free from the stresses of the real world. And the list goes on. However, in this arc, these themes are explored more effectively through Lady Farnese, constantly pretending to herself that the various horrific occurrences haven't happened and that she remains the pure, good, God-loving girl she wants to be, instead of the cold-blooded, hedonistic murderer she has been in the past. Speaking of which, let's talk about Father Mosgus. The depiction of Father Mosgus as the arbiter of God's will is one of the most horrifying depictions I've yet seen from this manga. Perhaps because he's paraded around as a function of the church and conceived of as a force of good. His design, I think, goes a long way in reaffirming this unsettled approach that I felt, with it being far more simple and expressionless than the other more anatomically accurate depictions of the human condition, further making him feel more other than any human we've come across so far in the story. Shifting gears for a moment, from evil to innocent comes the character of Isidro. I have no idea what the prevailing opinion is of this character online, but I honestly loved him. I thought he offered a reminder that innocence and childishness is still very much alive in this world and in the middle of these horrible events. I mean, like Puck said, this story would be too dark if they weren't there. With some additional surprising support in the various tense and high stakes action moments, in a way he sort of feels like a more standard shonen manga protagonist, but I think that could coupled with the nature of this story really had me worried for him on more than one occasion, further building up the tension in the scenes that he took part in. I was certain a brave kid like this wouldn't be long for this world, but every single time his attitude and skills lifted him out of the bad situations he found himself in, and I was relieved and hyped because of it. I also really enjoyed how the aspects of Isidro that kept him alive and allowed him to remain in a position of advantage were in fact his readiness to accept reality and warp it to suit him. Furthermore, Isidro, pretty much like Guts, fights against the idea of fate or what is established. He wants to be the best version of himself and sees Guts as someone to aspire to be like. I honestly think he's pretty awesome and I'm delighted that moving forward we'll get to see more of him. So look, okay. At this point, Kosk is alive, which is great, but she's in the heart of one of the worst situations in Midland and the center of what will be a dark event unlike anything we've yet seen in the story, save for perhaps the eclipse. Rest in peace, everyone. So. Let's see how this one pans out. Nina, Orgies, and the Cults. Peggy, 18. Some of the imagery in this is frightening, and perhaps not for the reasons you might be thinking. When I was in school, history was my favorite subject. I always treated the lessons like detailed stories of the past, and one of the topics that stunned me the most was the Black Death, a massive plague that wiped out over half of Europe, which, to be honest, is the clear inspiration for this plague right here in Midland. Massive amounts of refugees living on top of each other, terrible living conditions, horrible hygiene, widespread poverty, and hunger. The imagery Berserk depicts routine demonstrates some of the absolute worst in humanity and I think it's a wonderful means of creating those heroic and triumphant moments we remember in this series too. Which for one reason or another leads us to this hedonistic cultist orgy, never thought I'd say that, oh kinky, <laughs> with the character of Nina and her boy toy. To be clear, I'd hate Nina if not for the fact that she's this way by design. I'm not supposed to like her. What I do find interesting about her though is, similar to Lady Farnies, she has an internal struggle coming to terms with who she is and ought to be ethically. And that struggle is interesting given the various strains this story puts her through. Hashtag Barrowman. She also introduces us to these cultists, which let's be perfectly honest, creeped me the fuck out. Cultists that, ironically or unironically, sought a similar escapism to that of their religion-believing counterparts. And because of this, they see Casca as their new idol after witnessing what happens when her brand starts to bleed. However, this did get me thinking, because it seems like, contrary to Guts to some degree, the demonic presences protect Casca rather than attack her. And well, Long story short, because of this, most humans are turned into zombies and Mr. Goatman is turned into an actual demonic entity, the likes of which will haunt my nightmares forever. Alright, but look, I know what you're thinking. I glanced over something. 
Speaking on the poetry and parallels of these two opposing ideals colliding, we physically see them collide in the cave as the Holy Iron Chain Knights arrive and begin fighting these transformed heretics. It's total chaos. Everyone is here. Puck flies as fast as he can to get guts. Isidro snipes zombies with unlimited rock ammo like the absolute legend he is. And Casca is more vulnerable now than she ever has been. In the middle of absolute chaos and destruction, where the worst of the worst, both human and demon, battle each other, the lost, hurt, and fragile Casca is all alone, outnumbered by the hordes around her. And honestly, the way Miura keeps distancing both Guts and Casca is frustrating, but at this point, it's just overwhelming. It's terrifying. But in the middle of absolute despair, a faint but glimmering light soars through the battlefield, seizing my attention momentarily. Suddenly, a familiar silhouette cloaked in black flies across the page, both portrayed at the beginning as almost part of the background, and slowly, thanks to some expert paneling, they shift to being the focus of the fight. And at the height of the drama, a surging black whirlwind breaks through the tension, stopping time in its tracks for both sides in confrontation, and in an incredible panel, we finally see them. Guts and Casca reunited. The background is neither chaotic nor war-torn, just white and the traces of what's happened outside of one of the most intimate panels between two misfortunate souls. Separated from the rest of the conflict, separated from the rest of the world, those who struggle against this terrible fate are together once again. Naturally and regrettably, this couldn't last, and as Casca is soon apprehended and taken away to further destruction, much to Guts's anger, I couldn't help but remark, what a scene. The panel where they reunite is enough to make you cry. Miura manages to encapsulate all of the hurt, relief, and struggle on Guts's single expression contained on this one panel. It's a spectacular moment. Oh, yes. Oh my god, this panel is so Kino. This is more Kino than anything! Serpico versus Guts. The attempted escape from the chaos was compelling and tense, however, this was one of the smartest ambushes I've ever seen committed to the pages of a manga. I'll keep it brief, but this is certainly like one of the best fights I've enjoyed in the series. Applying knowledge we're already familiar with, the dutiful protector of Lady Farnese combined with precise placement for the battle orchestrates one of the most respectable one-on-one -on -one battles a character of his standing has ever attempted against Guts and in doing so has immediately catapulted him into the ranks of some of my favorite humans from this series. Knowing exactly where Guts' weak points are and where his own shortcomings lay, placing himself on a narrow ledge obstructing Guts' dominant hand and preventing him from drawing his sword are among just a few of the strategies implemented in this altercation. And the best thing about this character is that he doesn't take himself too seriously. He's often depicted in a much more humorous manner than I've come to expect from this series' antagonists, and I'm honestly a big fan, and with him providing the delay the Holy Iron Chain Knights needed to whisk Casca away, it's the perfect recipe to bring all the main players together for one final showdown. Saving Casca. Going into the endgame of this raid, I was left in a complete tizzy. I honestly couldn't predict what was going to happen. I just knew that I had to keep reading. I'm just so unbelievably invested in these characters and what little can be salvaged of Guts and Casca's relationship that I honestly felt like the worst was on the horizon for them. Miura had already demonstrated his ability to drag these characters down to depths I never before anticipated, and so he had me primed, expecting the very same this time around too. So much has gone wrong for Guts in this series, he's lost almost everything Thing and Casca could be, I think, perhaps the final nail in the coffin for him. Which I think went a very long way towards cultivating that love I have for Isidro's character. Casca is on the stakes, ready to be burned alive courtesy of Father Mosgus. Hate that guy. Guts is nowhere to be seen and otherwise trying and failing to get there on time. And just as I was resigned to yet another person in Guts's life being taken away from him for reasons he would no doubt blame himself for, Isidro drops from the heavens and hoists her up into the air. When this happened, I literally ran straight to my fiance and said, you see that kid? He's awesome. To which she said, Mark, it's 6 a.m. I'm trying to sleep. We have a great relationship. This climax honestly has it all, and Miura doesn't let us down in the artistic department either. Not one bit. Depicting Father Mosgos as an angelic figure of divinity there to protect the refugees only made me fall in love with this character more than I already have. And what's more was that the brilliant touch Miura gave to his character. Once he strips himself down to nothing but pure plates and muscle, his primary attack is a bludgeoning barrage of blunt strikes, there to represent 
represent a heretic stoning. He's the judge, jury, and executioner, and Miura has done everything to create a final battle between himself and Guts to rival many of the battles we've seen in the past. It's brilliant, honestly. I mentioned before how Farnese denies the ugly reality of the world she lives in by doing nothing and constantly saying to herself that everything is still the same. Her entire identity and sanity is built upon her religion. By experiencing the true force of the world in its most terrifying form, to the most heartbreaking forms by Mazgus turning into one of those semi-apostles, she finally finds something real in all of this. Guts. Standing alone, never breaking, and always fighting back against this chaotic reality check. Even in her confusion, when she almost drops her torch and begins praying to her already proven non-existent faith, lying to herself for the last time, it's Guts, much like he did with Jill in the previous arc, who helps her find the courage to fight back and take action by not depending and waiting for things to magically resolve by themselves, but instead through her own power. Farnese picks up her torch, and for the first time, she struggles against this cruel reality. And she decides to follow Guts and seek the answers to all of her questions by looking at the real world without clinging to false hopes or idols, followed by her loyal servant, Serpico. Similar to Isidro, I honestly cannot wait to see where this gang goes together with Guts in the future. And it's not just this. The real story of this arc has been Guts trying everything in his power to right the wrongs he's made and reconnect with Casca, to find her and to protect her in her current state. And at numerous instances, where that be the refugee camp, the cultist gathering, and the raid of the castle, there's always been something to prevent him from protecting her, stopping him from staying by the side of the one person he loves more than anyone. There's been a heavy emphasis on the themes of fate and causality through this story, which in some ways sort of conflict with each other. And now that the armies are marching, Griffith is flying away on his big buff Zod boy, and Guts is riding off into the dawn with Casca, I have no friggin' idea where this story is going to take me, and the best part is I'm only halfway through this series. What does get me excited though is that Isidro, Lady Farnese, and Serpico are following closely behind Guts and Casca. And in a way, this sort of makes me feel like they're building towards their very own Brand of the Hawk 2.0 right now, and I love all the characters present for it. I really hope the Falcon of the Millennium Empire arc will be as good as Conviction has been, but there's only one way to find out, guys. By diving straight into the next and final completed arc from Kentaro Miura's Berserk, the Falcon of the Millennium Empire arc. One thing I can say about Berserk categorically is that it is dense as all hell when it comes to its plot, themes, and character writing, and not necessarily in that order either. For that reason, I wasn't able to cover everything I wanted to in the last episode where I covered the Conviction arc's ending, and so, thankfully because this arc is much less complex, we have some extra time to quickly give my impressions on what happened with all that craziness. And while I really want to get into how this arc kicks off, like, seriously, what happened took me so off guard I nearly fell back into my chair. I want to talk about Mr. Eggman. I'm going to try to be honest here. I'm not sure I fully grasped what happened with regards to this weird guy following everyone and lurking in the shadows throughout a portion of that arc. With that said, something about his design, mixed with his uncharacteristic lack of involvement with the story, made me feel, I don't know, uneasy in ways this story hasn't managed to achieve thus far. And I've seen some stuff in this story. Upon closer inspection, the Conviction Arc, generally speaking, is all about what people desire the most and the conviction that it takes for them to achieve those ends. Ironically, or Fittingly, while the entire world is begging for salvation in the Conviction Arc, the Eggman, who comes from the worst, most rotten places of society, someone who doesn't even really consider himself a person, is the one that works as a vessel for this, quote, salvation, granting an answer to those desires by bringing the Hawk of Light into the mortal world. Griffith is back and seems to be totally fine again in his mortal form, which is... Oh my god. I don't even know if I can process that right now. The Eggman, as someone who watched over Albion and its people, first as a spectator and later as some sort of participant, transforming Mosgos and his torturers into semi-apostles, is easy to miss at first, but how this tiny thing became the center of the story, still without anybody noticing and achieving his own goals by literally changing the world forever, is poetic and sort of prophetic in a sense when you think about this arc's title. Furthermore, and we're getting there, the cursed child of Casca and Guts appeared many times during the story seemingly to protect Casca, but in the end runs out of gas or 
dies. Either way, he is absorbed by the Eggmen, so they both don't die alone. Which is so fittingly berserk, I don't know why I didn't see that coming. Is this the end of this character? Mm, I'm not so sure. I don't think Miura would make the cursed child show up just to help out the main character and then vanish, but only time will tell, I guess. By the end of the conviction arc itself, the predictions of Skull Knight are once again challenged by Guts, and once again, while everything happens according to what he says, one thing remains different. Guts and Casca are reunited, and it's thanks to all the people Guts knew and all the people that decided to follow him throughout this story. Interestingly, there are some similarities between events from the past that we can notice here too. We have another eclipse, Griffith is reborn into another divine being, Guts and Casca are saved, and even some parallels I mentioned before between Farnese and Casca also exist. And if we want to get really crazy, there could be some inversions at play here too. The Hawks die during the Eclipse in Golden Age's climax, while Guts' new friends all survive in conviction, and some of them even decide to follow his tracks. Perhaps this is an indication that Guts is slowly edging his way to an outcome that's imminently desirable rather than an outright horror show or a compromise like this conviction climax was. But okay, to round out my analysis of the Conviction Arc's conclusion, before I move on to something else, I think I should share my favourite part of this story, which was Guts's choosing of protection for Casca over vengeance towards Griffith. Having once been a man destroying himself on this endless, violent crusade for revenge, thanks to the lessons he's learned in this story, chose the less indulgent and selfish option. Guts, the protector of Casca. And interestingly, the panel structure here seems to be an homage to one of Miura's favourite mangas, Devil. Just a fun fact that I thought I'd include. With that said, Griffith's rebirth is astonishing. The circumstances surrounding the kingdom with the Kushan army in stride is pretty suspenseful. The people of Midland full of fear and hope is appropriate. And Guts and Casca fighting for their lives and Griffith flying over some of the most incredible landscapes I've ever seen in manga kicks off this next arc. Falcon of the Millennium Empire. As I noted towards the beginning of the last section, one of the arc's strong points is, I think, its ability to take complex emotional stakes and present them in a format that's honestly quite easy to follow on a surface level. This will help in my conciseness when writing this review. And so, instead of going through things one at a time in a boring fashion, considering that this arc thus far is split up into two plotlines, Guts and Griffiths respectively, I thought the best way to tackle this video is by exploring my impressions on each of these plotlines individually. That is, after what happens in the very first scene of this arc. When Guts arrived with Casca in tow to their small base of operations, and I saw that Griffith was waiting for them, I think I had what could only be described as a mild aneurysm. After having come to terms with choosing to protect Casca after giving up what was the perfect opportunity to take him out at the climax of the prior arc, seeing him here like this was one of the most stunning instances I've experienced in the story. There's been a running trend since the very beginning of this manga with it framing a number of instances and moments highlighting that Griffith is out of reach of Guts. Sometimes Sometimes metaphorically and sometimes quite literally. However, there have been instances where he surprised even Griffith with his very existence flying in the face of what should have happened to him by now. He should have died. Guts's sheer determination to struggle onward towards his goal is the savage heartbeat of this story. However, in this scene kicking things off, while Griffith appears to be the same person he knew back then, as he has been in the case of every prior tale, he is still unreachable. Zod, the immortal, stands before Guts as the formidable obstacle he is with a new conviction. His sword, once lost in the boredom of thousands of battles, finds a new purpose to protect his overlord, Griffith, against the giant dragon slayer of Guts. Once more, the two rivals clash. While watching this take place, it felt almost as if time was standing still. While the action is, naturally, as good as one might expect from Miura with some outstanding illustrations on display, it was Griffith's short conversation with Guts that retook really the reins of this scene for me. This is the first time these two have been in communication with each other in such a long period of time, and for Griffith to effectively espouse the same rhetoric and vibe as when he was in the Golden Age arc is both nostalgic and haunting at the same time with the context of what's happened since those simpler times. And it's in this short but illuminating conversation we notice something a little different about Guts. Instead of the man who had a clear conviction for revenge or protection, he seems to be stuck in a sort of limbo, unable to fully and completely dedicate himself to one goal. More on that in just a bit. 
There was one instance that I found quite surprising during this scene, and that was Griffith's sudden protection of Casca. There's the obvious contrast being made here with Guts in that Griffith seems to be single-minded in his goals, and therefore without hesitation can act, in this case protecting Casca. However, this conflicts quite violently, I think, with the heinous acts he's perpetrated in the past to both Guts and specifically Casca. He's perfectly willing to sacrifice any number of people if it means him reaching his goal of ruling over a kingdom, but this stands in direct contrast contrast with that. I'm not sure what to make of it, but perhaps it's a mind game. The very last time Guts saw Griffith in this state and appearance, he had left Griffith outmatched and defeated, on his knees as he walked off in the snow. Snow in this series carries with it a tremendous amount of symbolism I've noticed. It can be interpreted as the cleaning of the old slate and fresh start, and it can be emblematic of isolation and emptiness. When Guts defeated Griffith back during the Golden Age arc, he inadvertently shook the status quo in everyone's eyes, and Griffith knew that. Which in addition to his caring for Guts was part of the reason why he reacted like he did. However, this scene's conclusion almost acts as Griffith's revenge for that moment as he leaves Guts alone in the snow after a crushing battle with his minion, Zod. With him holding all the cards and through Casca reminding him of what he did to her. But that's just my take. Following this scene, the two main characters, Guts and Griffith, fracture into two separate storylines. While they naturally reconnect at a later point, I will be diving into Guts's portion of the story first, as it's by far what I have the most to talk about, and by extension, what I found the most entertaining and interesting. Guts. Picking up the pieces following this climactic battle, a new goal or destination becomes apparent. Casca cannot take care of herself, and this safe haven they once knew has been destroyed because of Guts' battle with Zod. Perhaps, again, this could be symbolic that Guts can't have it both ways. He can protect Casca while also fighting Zod and by proxy, Griffith. This speaks to the conflict in Guts' mind, which this arc deals with predominantly as he travels to Puck's home, the land of the elves. And this is where the character writing for Guts gets extremely interesting. On these travels, Guts realizes how difficult it is fighting the demons of the night that attack while also having to consider Casca's protection. Everything was easier when he didn't need to hold back, when he could indulge in that more animalistic side of himself, that side that he knew could struggle and survive. However, he can't do that now. He has to fight 10 times harder in order to stay alive and to protect Casca, and can't afford to be a savage sword seeking blood any longer. Now he instead has to learn to be a shield and a sword, the pressure of which ends up breaking him. A sentiment echoed through quotes like, Sword feels heavier than ever, or Casca is a shell of the person she once was. Is there any trace of the old Casca inside of her? Or even, he wanted to rescue her and now he did. Now what? He reached the goal, but how can he keep his promise to her, and to himself, of never abandoning her? All of these quotes speak to the frustration, the conflict, and ultimately the mindset of Guts that wants to believe Casca is worth it. But just like in every difficult challenge, there's always that side that tries to rationalize a way out of that tough responsibility. Particularly when the stakes are as high as they are for Guts. And this is where Miura decided to explore something really interesting within Guts' character. Since the beginning of the story, there's always been a more primal or beast-like persona that Guts would embody in order to successfully survive his day-to-day -day existence. What I once thought was an artistic choice depicting Guts as this beast of the darkness has become a very tangible and real plot element. Since Lost Children, we've been aware of the Beast in Black, and following a difficult series of frustrations surrounding Casca, struggling to protect her and even questioning whether or not he should any longer, she goes missing. After having promised himself that he would never lose her again, in the adrenaline, fear, and frustration, Guts snaps. The beast once again takes over, and in the process, hurts Casca, scars Casca, the person he loves the most. In a fashion eerily reminiscent of what Griffith committed, he became a monster. And if we ignore the obvious and awful imagery for a second, there's a phenomenal piece of storytelling taking place here through this character that calls all the way back to the very beginning of his life. And that character being called back to is Gambino. When we were first introduced to Gambino way back at the very beginning of the Golden Age arc, we were presented with this rough around the edges, tough soldier type that was good at what he was, a soldier, a fighter, a killer. If he wasn't good at being that, then he would have likely died long before he could even have been any sort of father figure, good or bad, to Guts when he was younger. 
However, once he lost his ability to fight, he started to more obviously and overtly lash out in terrible ways, which ultimately led to his downfall. He couldn't be a good father, a good nurturer, or a good carer, perhaps in part because all of his life he had to do the opposite to survive, to look out only for himself. This obviously isn't to excuse anything he did in the story, but it speaks to perhaps his mindset and psychology when in those moments. This facet of his being being perhaps so useful in keeping him alive that it became who he was and when he was stripped of his ability to utilize that strength, he broke. Similarly, Guts has lived a life as of late where he's been forced to fight for his life against odds he's been told are insurmountable with death waiting around every single corner. In order to survive this, Miura has shown us how animalistic and beast-like he becomes once fighting off hordes of monsters and demons. Defying what he was told was impossible. It served him as a useful function and as such has pushed him in a direction of being someone that wants to be alone and wants to be someone that relishes in crushing the weak and taking what he can for himself. Which brings us to this moment where he makes the decision to not indulge in those heinous acts any longer and instead do what's difficult. He decided to care. To care for and above all else protect Casca. And along the way, he quickly discovers how difficult it is to do that. How difficult it is to remain compassionate and human in those dire circumstances. And how easy it might be during those more difficult moments to allow oneself to be lost to those darker impulses. In other words, in real time we are seeing what it might have been like for someone not as strong as Guts to go through something like this in Gambino. What it might have been like for a prisoner of war who can't let the battle go. And following this, Guts feels horrific. And rightfully so. The very same trauma Guts experienced and in many ways still is experiencing after what Gambino did to him was what he passed on to Casca. What he scarred Casca with. The fear of being touched. Or more specifically in this instance, the fear of Guts himself. How can they keep going? Well, Yura gave us an answer almost immediately. Guts needs help. Farnis and Serpico since their introduction to this story halfway through the Conviction arc after Lost Children, the dynamic of Serpico and Lady Farnese has been an enjoyable one. And perhaps that's putting it a little too lightly. Serpico from the outset is very easy to respect and cheer for. Even when he decided to take on the main character Guts on the side of a cliff during the Conviction arc, I still found myself cheering his innovative and opportunistic efforts in taking down Guts to help his Lady Farnese. However, with her on the other hand, Having been introduced as a religious extremist with strong swaths of sadism right beneath her unassuming and innocent facade, Lady Farnese has been a character I never thought I would get the chance to actually explore in greater detail, let alone appreciate. Berserk is in one way or another quite interested in demonstrating how awful people can be while also possessing the courage to explore the reasons as to why that might be the case. Farnese is shown to be a hateful, entitled, scornful bigot that relishes in the literal burning of innocent people. And yet through the flashbacks we receive either through Serpico and herself, we discover that her upbringing was far from normal or secure in some senses through the eyes of Serpico himself. Serpico's journey and history is as you might expect. He's a determined, attentive, and appreciative individual with unwavering loyalty to those he feels a connection with. Having come from the slums and from a mother that struggled to cling to reality, it was Farnese's request to take him in that ultimately plucked him from a life of scrounging to a life by her side, where Serpico ended up witnessing some of the unsavory aspects of her character and many of her struggles firsthand. And this is where there might be a parallel to point out with regards Lady Farnese and Casca. Casca and Farnese are sort of a package deal in this arc, you see. All the while Guts does what Guts does best, hack and slash, Farnies guards Casca with her life, something she never would have done when we first encountered her. In other words, she seems to be on a path to redemption. It's made clear early in this arc that Farnies carries with her an admiration and curiosity for Guts and what he's managed to show her. Since meeting him, her entire worldview has not only been challenged, but successfully shattered. Compare this to Casca's experience with Griffith, who changed her world view and following that held her devotion. Casca was lost in a fantasy, an idealistic cocoon-like vision of what Griffith really was. Farnes, on the other hand, by following Guts, has managed to actually better herself. She's gotten stronger both mentally and physically, and in addition to that, Serpico has even remarked that she's becoming more compassionate. She's starting to feel more human. In other words, Guts was a positive influence on her life, while Griffith was a negative one on Casca's. And fittingly, Farnese becomes Casca's security blanket in this section. Isidro. 
There isn't a lot to discuss here, at least not in comparison to Guts, Casca, Farnese, or even Serpico, but I am thoroughly enjoying what Isidro contributes to the story in more than one way. On a surface level, there's something to appreciate with his growing rapport alongside Puck. Their comedy helps to alleviate the dire or intense scenes a little bit, and by doing so, helps to enhance those more serious moments by creating a wonderful contrast in tone. A similar technique has been used not only in comics, but also live action films for decades. For reference, think about how effective Robin Williams was at shifting from humor to more dramatic tones in the blink of an eye. They often go hand in hand. I mentioned before that I appreciated the commonalities that existed between Isidro and a more traditional shonen protagonist also, which shine through magnificently within this portion of the story. While he is by no means the focus, the minor subplot or character arc he's undergoing in this arc is quite cathartic. He wants to be the best at what he's trying to do, and when he doesn't measure up to the other talents of other warriors in the party like Guts or Serpico, you can visibly see the disappointment in himself to send across his face. And while this aspect of him is explored in more detail with Guts encouraging him to use his strengths and to follow what feels right to him, the real struggles in his development are made with the introduction of a brand new character and addition to the party, the little witch, Shiruke. Shiruke and the Astral World. Magic has joined the party, ladies and gentlemen. Now that might sound like a tongue-in-cheek comment, but in reality, it's true. I don't want to spend a ton of time speculating on the circumstances surrounding the astral world and what the ramifications of that might be, because I'm smart enough to understand that I can't fully comprehend the scope of what this offers the story in the future. However, I will speak to what I think of the character Shiruke. The Little Witch in Training is an interesting addition to the story from a conceptual and utilitarian standpoint with regards to the narrative. She offers a bunch to the party that they otherwise cannot do, and she acts as a manifestation of magic in this world in a big and bombastic way. And quite auspiciously, she offers an interesting contrast to Isidro's character too. Where Isidro acts as a naive blowhard, surprised when he can't live up to his own expectations, Shiruke seems to be the exact opposite of that. She's had the necessary training, the backing of her mentor and teacher, but lacks the belief in herself and her abilities in many ways to fully make use of them. This is specifically interesting as Isidro's dynamic with her fuels his own insecurities. Acting at first towards her as one of the boys in this team, he slowly realizes that she is far more capable than he is feuding this feeling of inadequacy that he has. And that's not even to make mention of the magic on display here. Since Griffith did the whole Ooga Booga and became the demon of the night, and then the Hawk of Light once again in his reincarnation, it's no exaggeration to state that in the immortal words of Will Smith, this world has been flipped turned upside down. Demons are everywhere and now magical creatures roam the land thanks to the astral world intersecting with the reality Guts understands. Interestingly, Shiruke, all the while she has to contend with her own uncertainty. I adore what she means for the story and how she impacts the actions of the rest of the party. That isn't even to make mention of the massive water bending and darkness entity she manages to entangle herself within, which in and of itself is inherently interesting as a power set from a visual standpoint, but also because of the drawback to using such a massive amount of magic. At numerous times we see her unable to disconnect and almost lose herself in these moments of entanglement, and it's just fascinating watching as she picks and chooses when to make use of these abilities she has. Particularly interesting in the context of her being this fledgling witch tasked with holding everyone else's hand through this experience. It's wonderfully handled. Like, she gives the team their own enchanted items. Serpico becomes a feather-dusting airbender. Isidro becomes a pyromaniac and Guts gets the Big, Big Black, Black armor, armor, otherwise known as the Berserker Armor. I touched on this aspect of Guts' character in the early portion of this video and cited his more animalistic side coming out, manifesting in a very physical and real way. It was horrific. And well, this berserker armor is sort of the natural extension on that idea, with even more trade-offs beyond the clear and obvious psychological ones on both himself and those he inflicts pain upon. The berserker armor, as I understand it, is brilliant for all the same mechanical reasons as the Kaioken is in Dragon Ball Z. There's a tremendous entertainment and suspense factor attached to it. While it amplifies the wearer's strength and resilience, the damage the body is forced to absorb is compounded by the armor's ability to keep the wearer going. This aspect of the armor, in addition to the primal, animalistic, and frankly demonic state Guts is now tapping into, creates the perfect storm for this armor to work its magic. And work its magic it most certainly does. Once Griffith's forces ambush the team, with one of the main warriors in those forces, Grunbeld, looking to take on Guts one on one. And with the Berserker armor, it becomes clear that Grunbeld, despite wanting a real fight, must assume his real form in order to survive this encounter with this new power of guts. And his real form is... oh, it's spectacular. 
The dude is a giant crystal dragon. The page spread revealing his true form was absolutely gorgeous. It's certainly up there with some of the most impactful page turns for me in this series. And I love how his white, regal, and bright facade clashes and contrasts starkly with the black, savage, and dark appearance of Guts and his newly acquired armor. The fight is great, but ultimately serves the narrative function of communicating how his new Berserker armor works. And long story short, it's sick and it works great. The Beach Guts and his party at the beach is a beautiful chapter with Miura at his best in terms of character writing. Shiruke and Guts begin to formulate the foundations of a closer relationship, ultimately focusing on the issues that both he, Guts, and she, Shiruke, have to contend with moving forward with both of them carrying a tremendous amount of weight on their shoulders, respectively, both dealing with difficult decisions they need to make. Shiruke needing to follow her late teacher's lessons in finding a way to believe in what Guts can do, despite her head telling her that it's impossible. Which is sort of ironic because she deals specifically in magic, which in and of itself is sort of beyond belief. And then we have Guts, on the other hand, staring at what he could be pursuing. A quiet and normal life for Casca. But this is berserk, and a tranquil, quiet moment can't last too long. Cutting this warm moment short, Skullline appears again to tease us once more with Guts' destiny, and in doing so, addresses something important, helping us understand that in order to deal with Griffith, one has to challenge the world's rules. This speaks to Shiruke's issue somewhat, but I wonder if this armor Guts has recently acquired transcends his body to something more than human, or perhaps he could be speaking to his demonic state, only time will tell, I suppose. But one thing that has struck me from this arc has been when Skull Knight remarks on some potential good news Guts received about Casca. The Elf King they are heading towards seems to have the ability to restore Casca to who she was once before. This is insanely great news for Guts. However, this is berserk. Skull Knight speculates as to whether or not Casca will wish for the same thing Guts desires, and it's a frightening sentiment and possibility for Guts to have to contend with. However, the more I think about it, the more I can make sense of that statement. It's been remarked upon numerous times that this Casca is distinctly different to the Casca we all know and love from before in Golden Age, and so, in theory, making this wish for her, in a sense, would be like asking to be killed and born anew. This current Casca would need to make the wish to reset and restore the previous Casca with different memories, an entirely different person. Suddenly, this fairy tale like mechanic is dealing with some really complex philosophical questions about identity and existence. The final thing I want to acknowledge about Guts' squad before I move on to Griffith is this little kid that Casca picks up at the beach. There's something weird about this kid, something mystical or, I don't know, something. They sort of look like Mokuba from Yu-Gi-Oh! And with this thematic tie to Casca, I can only imagine how this little one would play a role in how his story unfolds moving forward. Griffith and speaking of unfolding stories, it's finally time to properly meet the invaders to Midland and by association Griffith to this portion of the story. Now seeing as I will only be reviewing the first half of this arc, Griffith's portion of the story is actually significantly smaller than the team of Guts's. So let's explore what I can concerning his return and expansion into Midland. Much the same as the Golden Age arc, Griffith is depicted as this ethereal and angelic presence descending onto the filthy commoners groveling in fear. Since the beginning of this story, the Kushan Empire has never been a focus, but boy does it play a leading role as the main obstacle to Griffith and his new crew. The new Band of the Hawk is unveiled piece by piece to us, with each subsequent area Griffith conquers and liberates coming from the Kushan Empire and with it bringing a new addition to his crew. There's this little girl called Sonya that has this strange, almost psychic ability and similar to Casca, she has become infatuated or obsessed in a sense with Griffith, for it was his presence she believes that granted her that power. Other characters joined the ranks early on, both human and, uh, I guess, dragon alike, as we saw earlier. However, we don't really come to fully comprehend the full scope of Griffith's new army until we come to know the character of Mule, a newly liberated leader that soon gets befriended by Sonya, and in her efforts to introduce him to Griffith personally, she walks him past increasingly creepy and creepier followers until he reaches a literal demonic entities lurking in the dead of night. Griffith is dealing with a whole new level of force when it comes to his army, granting us perhaps a glimpse of the sort of kingdom Griffith expects to rule over. Of all the conquests and captures in these chapters for Griffith and the new Band of the Hawk, by far my favourite scene comes in the form of Griffith's advancement and attack on the Kushan Emperor, Ganeshka. This fellow is an apostle, yes, however, he is distinctly different to all the others we've seen so far as he refuses to vow himself to any one allegiance beyond his own, 
not even the God Hand. By their very nature, apostles normally will follow the orders of the God Hand, yet this character wants to transcend them. He says, I'll reign over this unclean world as a demon king and rebel against God. He wants to become a higher power, which makes him the perfect enemy to Griffith in this part of the story. However, I would be lying if I said that this character alone is the reason this scene is my favorite, because he's not. He's not even remotely my favorite aspect of it. This is. There's a tremendous amount of history between Griffith and Princess Charlotte. We know what Griffith wants. We know what he's done in the past to her. We know what he's become. We understand Charlotte's desire to be with him again, and we can all see where this whole scene is going. What was once depicted as a horror show when Griffith last climbed through her window is presented in this instance like a fantastic joyous storybook ending to a romance that spanned generations. The paneling here is spectacular, and the look on Charlotte's face says it all. Carried forth by a one-horned beast across the sparkling night sky atop her bed, Griffith, her dazzling Prince Charming, has come to her rescue. Where this will go, I perish the thought. Which finally brings us full circle to the unexpected reunion of the two main parties, Guts's team and Griffith's band. And strangely, there's no conflict upon first encounter. Griffith doesn't see Guts again, but instead, Shirake encounters Sonia, the girl that can read Becoming fast friends in the process, Sonya offers Shirake to come with them, but ultimately Shirake declines. Funnily enough, during this too, Isidro meets a knight as he fights with the pirate at the port. This knight is obviously Azan, after taking the blame for Supercon and Farnese's leaving of the Holy Chain Knights. I've elected to henceforth call him totally not Azan. The first portion of this section largely deals with Lady Farnese's desire to help her friends solve a rather persistent issue. The acquisition of a ship with which to sail to their desired destination. All the while, Superco has his own issues he needs to deal with, but I'll get to him in just a second. With Farnese, throughout this journey, she's transformed from a self-obsessed, confused, and delusional girl full of hatred and sadistic tendencies to a strong young woman slowly coming to terms with reality beyond the scope of many, all the while showing a warmth within her that's unmatched by many, if not all, of the party. And it's a testament to her character that this warmth and care she shows towards Casca and the desire she gets to broaden her horizons with magic gets shelved or put on the back burner indefinitely for the express purposes of helping her friends acquire a ship, even if that means them moving on with their journey without her. It's an interesting plot point in its own right, introducing us to the broader family and the struggle for power and respect that dwells there. But as I mentioned, it too serves and executes brilliantly the function of highlighting just how far Lady Farnese has come as a human being in this story. Furthermore, as a quick aside, I really like the role magic as a concept is playing in this tale. It represents the change that's taking place both figuratively and literally inside of her, opening herself up to the possibilities that she might be able to change. And for her, seeing the results of magic would act as somewhat of a validation for that change. However, now she seems to have lost her nerve, opting to be of use in the only way she sees herself to be of use to others, as a pawn providing a ship to her friends. However, in making that decision, ironically and appropriately, she unconsciously demonstrates that exact change she wishes to see within herself by making that very choice, leveraging her status as an aristocrat, marrying herself off. And while Guts and Co, in quite a cute and familial fashion, move to confront her about this, to rescue her from herself, the monsters they once saw at the shores during the last section start to emerge, all the while another obstacle makes himself known before standing in their way. Ding ding ding, it's Serpico versus Guts round two. While Guts is all muscle and tenacity, Serpico is all strategy and tactics. And fittingly, this acts as a great lesson for Isidro as he watches the conflict. Once upon a time, he was taught the value of understanding one's shortcomings as a fighter in a fight. And Serpico is the physical manifestation of that very idea to its extreme. But ignoring Isidro for a second, the story of this fight is a profound one that's beautiful in its depth of character introspection. Conflict. Fights and contests between two individuals in manga and indeed story are great because of the contrast and indeed information the readers or viewers can glean from that contrast. You need look no further than Goku and Vegeta in Dragon Ball or more abstractly Luffy versus the world government in One Piece. When two forces clash they highlight their respective differences. In the prior two examples many of the encounters these contests share serve to highlight the struggle between good versus evil. However with regards Serpico and Guts in this instance the contrast and conflict 
doesn't serve to highlight the struggle of good versus evil necessarily, but instead something far more nuanced and fundamental to each respective character that speaks to the soul of their respective designs. In Berserk, Guts represents struggle and tenacity in the face of overwhelming terror and destruction. Serpico, on the other hand, as he puts it, adapts to his circumstances to fill a role that is presented to him, to accept what is before him even if it is unreasonable. And so, unbeknownst to me, as this fight unraveled, it revealed itself to be a classic clash of ideologies, not good versus evil necessarily again, but more so an irresistible force, Guts, versus the immovable object of Serpico. However, only one here seems to be struggling with something, and it isn't Guts. Addressing Guts as someone he, Serpico, who once turned a blind eye to everything, can now not simply ignore, and as a result fears what might happen if he discovers more about himself and continues to change in this party, what that change might manifest as within him. And so, interestingly, while Lady Farnese's story is all about her desire for something more to change herself, Serpico's story seems to be more about his desire to remain the same, to not change into someone who can't turn a blind eye like he used to. He doesn't trust Guts entirely, and that scares him. The fight itself ends about as fast as it begins, however, and while there were some tremendous ideas on display with some wonderful introspection from Serpico, Guts emerges the victor. And the panels both leading up to and during this fight were spectacular. There's such a wonderful sense of motion with each panel beautifully and perfectly connecting the threads of Serpico's thoughts to the motions of his sword. More so perhaps than any other fight in this series, I really felt the rhythm of this one. Like a dance, the fight worked with the story being told, each more emphatic and effective because of each other. Following this event, Guts, Serpico, and the team storm the banquet hall Lady Farnies and her family are residing within, just in the nick of time too to make the save. And perhaps this is a coincidence, but I may have noticed that there were some similarities to how Farnies was saved by Serpico when compared to Guts's save with Casca way back when. Instead of a flash of black, there was a flash of white before Serpico appears by Farnies' side, protecting her from harm. However, unlike the previous encounters where Farnies felt like a burden, while Guts was hacking tiger monsters in tremendous fashion into bits and Serpico went to take down the source of the trouble, in front of her family and indeed her companions, Farnes takes down a tiger using a magical item, proving to herself that she is capable of the sort of change she desires to see in herself. And as a short plot beat, I really like this. Something I did neglect to mention in the prior video was a certain encounter Guts has with a particular member of a significant group. You might have heard of him, the God Hand. As we saw in the Conviction arc, Conrad, one of the God Hand members, was responsible for the plague in Midland. All the while Slan, the girly God Hand member, was responsible for the orgy club Nina was part of. And during the events of this arc's first half, you may have noticed that we met with her again, manifesting herself via troll intestines, tempting Guts to use his behelet and become an apostle. The God Hand are always present in this story, and for a reason that's more than likely going to be clear in the not-so-distant future. Everything they've done so far, even putting everything in place for Griffith's and incarnation ceremony seems to be connected to Griffith himself. But Slan's presence here not only serves to make this obvious, but also to introduce us to something even more terrifying. Enter the Sword of Actuation. Skull Knight Sword made of behelots. Otherwise known as the most metal concept for a weapon in the entire series. This is a weapon that's been created by Skull Knight that has been specifically crafted to kill inhumans. The concept of this sword is absolutely insane and abundantly clear why Skull Knight is the main enemy of the God Hand members. It can basically cut through reality, reaching even the deepest layers of the astral world. You might remember the abyss that sucked in all the humans way back in like the Black Swordsman arc. Yeah, the sword can get you even there if you want. And this is how Skull Knight helps Guts out in that instance. But man, we haven't seen yet just how fucking powerful this sword can actually be. Okay, so this part is sort of a transitional period between the scene we just finished with the party and the next big one. We're greeted by yet more stunningly and distressingly grotesque artwork courtesy of Miura himself. Massive page spreads illustrating the invasion of this land by the monsters that emerge from the shadows. Crocodiles, tigers, monsters, and soldiers all the same. It's quite ominous, and basically our takeaway at this point should be... Leaving this village will be no easy task, but fret not because Roderick is a badass who sets them up with a ship just like that. 
However, before boarding the ship, they notice that the harbor is infested with monsters, hundreds of them. Shirake effectively tells Guts to step down and to leave it to her as they stand guard. They bide their time together as Shirake becomes a raging inferno monster, leaving the surrounding area a scorched earth destroying every single enemy available to her. I like this not just for the cool visuals, but also the team effort it took to pull this off. It's nice. However, it's not enough as tons more massive monsters suddenly appear with Guts going into berserker mode. And this magic man, I won't even attempt to embarrass myself by trying to pronounce the name of, appears. Impressed by Guts' ability and his armor. And this is where things get a little cool. Shirake reaches into Guts' psyche to create this conscious state where Guts gets to use the Berserker armor while fully in control of his faculties, thus creating a sort of nice symbiotic relationship between these two characters that were once sort of at odds with each other. Moreover, specifically, I love this mechanism within the suit itself. It has direct ties to the Cracks in the Blade chapter's themes way back during the Conviction arc. To use the suit to its fullest potential is akin to embracing hatred itself, which if we look to the cracks in the blade chapter, we can see this is akin to being selfish, meaning the hardest way, the most courageous way is to do what's best for those you love and for those that depend on you. That's what makes for the correct moral choice in this series and in essence is what I love most about Guts as a character. This internal struggle, he's flawed, has desires and yearns to do the right thing even if it's the hardest path forward. I mean, he's a true hero. Again, this is a terrific piece of development for Shirake too. Since her introduction, she's been encouraged by one person or another to have faith in those she fights with. In this case, Guts. Time and again, she recognizes the circumstances Guts finds himself in as impossible to overcome, and yet, he still persists on living, on struggling forward. This fundamentally changes her, and in this scene, we see just how much she has changed. Willing to follow Guts' rash plan of action, placing all of her faith into him when he requests it. It's a wonderful team effort from both Guts and Shirake that speaks to both their characters perfectly. Shirake is required to shoulder the mental toil while Guts absorbs the physical punishment. This is all to say that this fight was really cool and honestly, I was expecting it to end here. However, it didn't. And as it turns out, this fight we just concluded our discussion on was actually just a warm-up fight to something I never in a million years saw coming. Dot. おい、俺の指叩き落とされたくなりゃ、俺の言う通りに飛べ。てめえとの決着は後だ。奴を撃ってあげる。寝ぼけとく。霞を貫く矛の。ある。霞を切り抜きな。ここに。よかろう。様の
he has his dream. He's going to achieve it, and he meant that in the most honest and straightforward way he could. There are a few moments in the story where Griffith gets to speak frankly and introspectively with us as an audience to see, so I see this instance as pivotal not only for him, but how his relationship with Guts will ultimately conclude down the road. You just don't say stuff like this without planning for it to service the conclusion of an arc later on down the line. From this scene, he cites that he couldn't really have a friend beyond someone that too chose to chase their dream irrespective of who or what stood in their way. That then and only then, when another would pursue their dream in full mind, body and spirit, could he respect them enough to see them as an equal worthy of friendship. And bouncing off of that idea presented by Griffith back during the Golden Age, I wonder if the fact Griffith is so inhuman in his devotion to his individual goal, I wonder if that is the mechanism by which he seems to have an allyship or connection with someone like Zod. And furthermore, why when Guts falters, he either faces Zod head on, or receives help from his metaphysical opposite in this world, Skull Knight. There's a scene where Zod speaks to Sonya for a short while, within which Sonya acts as a proxy through which a question can be posed towards Zod concerning his destiny. It's a choice he needs to make. It is, and I quote, to again battle a sword that cuts your own flesh, or to make it your own weapon. When I saw this quote, I sort of leaned back into my chair and tried to absorb the meaning of this beyond the obvious implications. Prophecy is clearly something that plays a pivotal role in this world and indeed this story. When I look at Zod's contribution to the series, I think, okay, so he helps Guts, but then he also doesn't. He's sympathetic towards Guts, but then he tries to kill him while also helping his arch nemesis Griffith. The quote directed towards Zod in this instance obviously speaks to a prime directive he seems to be at odds with in his mind and indeed with those around him of similar nature. As a monster, he, like everyone else similar to him, feels this desire to squash guts and devour him when he's weakest. He is a marked human after all, however he chooses to deny that. Much the same way Ganeshka has chosen his own path, resulting in one of the absolute best, and I mean BEST! Two page spreads of not just the series, but any comic or any image I might have ever seen. I mean, look at it. I want this as a poster. Never in all of my life have I seen such incredible, dynamic, powerful artwork in a manga. But that too got me thinking about what this means regarding the second half of that quote from Sonya. That being, or to make the sword your own weapon. Naturally, this refers to Guts in this instance. Zod and Guts, in the heat of battle, chose to work alongside one another to strike down Ganishka, a shared foe, before going their separate ways at the end. With plenty of symbolic gestures showing the growth Guts has undergone as a character. For if he were to have followed hatred, he would have no doubt died there and then. Which makes me wonder if this quote can be extrapolated upon and viewed through the lens of Guts and Griffith's relationship specifically. There seem to me at least to be a lot of parallels between this quote, Zod, and Guts' time spent on the pages of this manga. And so I wonder if a similar choice might present itself for Guts somewhere down the line. If we look all the way back to the Golden Age, following his desertion of the Band of the Hawk, he left in search of his own dream. In other words, he had no conviction at the time. Which, if we cast our minds back to the chapter Campfire of Dreams, is exactly the topic of which he felt alienated by. And fast forward again, once he lost everything upon his return, he gained a tremendous hatred and, by extension, a desired goal. Through the conviction arc, we then learn that this desire he had to kill Griffith was an entirely vapid, cowardly, and selfish desire which flew in the face of his true dream, that being to save Casca. And in this moment, it's that exact impulse or dream which acts as his salvation. So it makes me wonder, Griffith has been a sword which has wounded Guts in the past. Will Guts, like Zod had to do here and now, need to make that same decision? A decision he struggled with since the start of the story. Will Guts be forced to make a decision not to kill Griffith, but to instead fight alongside him for some greater cause? This seems like the natural extreme or destination of this philosophy the story has been exploring and what makes sense to me right here and now. I think at this point it's important to remember that we are only seeing this story really through the eyes and experiences of Guts for the most part. The most introspection we get from Griffith comes by way of Guts's point of view mostly. And the same can be pretty much said for every other character, which is what makes scenes like this one Sonya shared with Zod prior to his save all the more interesting and noteworthy. We follow Guts's struggle and travels and due to that it's easy to forget that with regards to most other characters, 
Zod and Griffith included, they each have undergone a tremendous amount of suffering and struggle in order to achieve what their own respective goals are. Guts denies himself the catharsis of embracing hatred, Zod denies himself the desire to devour Guts when he's most vulnerable, and perhaps even Griffith, the most alien perspective to us right now, is also ignoring something he desires in order to achieve his dream. Switching gears for a second, let's talk a bit about Griffith and his situation. The Kushin advancement onto the battlefield to face the weakened forces of the Holy Sea army was presented in quite an unfamiliar fashion to me. For much of it, there's virtually no dialogue to speak of, forcing our full attention on the overwhelming strength of Ganishka's forces. Things aren't looking good, but Griffith and his new Band of the Hawk show up in similar fashion as they did in the Golden Age to save the day. I thought at the time of reading this that he would no doubt be looking to climb the ranks of this new army too, but... Griffith is 10 steps ahead apparently. He challenges Ganishka to a fight one on one at another location far from here, thus creating a scene wherein he saves the entire army from certain destruction. This creates a fantastic morale and rapport between himself and his subjects to be right off the bat. Couple that with the presence of Princess Charlotte and this religious figure and you have for yourself not just a hero like we saw in Golden Age, but a full blown savior in the eyes of these people. Griffith has finally become in many ways a god to these folks. And speaking of Godlike, Farnese progresses her training on the ship to the astral plane, with some of the most beautiful page spreads I've seen from Miura. But moreover, this scene stands alongside one of my favorite quotes in this arc. I guess even if you force back what was lost, it still won't be the way it was. In this short but brilliant quote, there's callbacks to both Cracks in the Blade and also Casca's attempted suicide in the Golden Age arc. And funnily enough, it all stems from what Guts perceives Casca to be to him at that very moment in time. There's no question that she's an enormous burden, the likes of which even Guts on his own would struggle to handle. And we are talking about someone who can handle pretty much anything, it seems. She's terrified of him. She's effectively an entirely different person, void of speech or really any form of communication to him. What's left, he must be thinking. As she falls overboard and Guts jumps to save her, unlike during the Golden Age where he catches her, she slips through the fingers of his false limb and falls before needing to be rescued afterwards. Upon reflection, Guts shares this profound quote that speaks to the conflict in his mind concerning a question that he was posed in a prior section at the beach. They are traveling to Puck's home in the hopes that Casca can be restored to her former self. But what if she doesn't want to change back? What if she can't? What if you can't force back what was lost? What if it will always be the way that it is now? No do-overs. There's a tremendous amount of sadness in this chapter and an all too familiar sense of hopelessness to boot. The limb that once reached out and saved Casca from falling is now missing, replaced with a weapon. A bringer of death without the ability to save what's most important to him anymore. It's a wonderful piece of symbolism that caps off this section of the story with a grim reminder that overcoming one's demons isn't as simple as many stories might lead you to believe. This isn't a Disney film or a Ghibli epic. And despite this being a tale of good and evil, fairies and dragons, zombies and monsters, it's also a story detailing a realistic struggle one man has to undergo for the sake of others, not just during a pivotal part of his life, wherein he learns a single lesson to overcome a singular trauma, but instead, this is a part of him that he has to now learn to live with and manage for possibly the rest of his life. The beast that dwells within him is there, alive and well, perhaps never to truly leave him in peace. Of all the demons that have followed Guts throughout this long, winding and harrowing journey, it's himself, the beast in black, his darker tendencies that will force him to run for the rest of his life, perhaps. Further adding another layer of interest and nuance to this growing quagmire of a problem he's faced with, Guts seems to find himself entrenched in an unsolvable situation. But at least for the time being, he still has his allies, his friends. A surprisingly effective and helpful newcomer to the party comes in the form of Roderick, with his incredible nautical experience coming in immeasurably handy to ensure their safe passage across the sea. It's a scene that reinforces just how much Guts needs these people he surrounded himself with. Thank heavens for them, for without, he would almost certainly be lost in every sense of the word. But okay, so that's what's going on with Guts' side of the coin. What about with Griffith? In prior videos, I reacted to and discussed Griffith's return to the physical world, exploring the massive changes his very presence implies in isolation. Due to this presence, his being alive and well once again, it means both mortal and astral worlds are getting closer, and many creatures and monsters that once only existed in the first layer of the astral plane are now invading the mortal realm. As I alluded to a moment ago, this is because Griffith's newest incarnation shouldn't exist and therefore breaks the rules and laws of nature and the world itself. He 
He's a super powerful astral angel in a physical body. With the likes of Skullnight even going as far as to say that the only way that they can stop him is to also exist beneath the limbo that defines the natural order of things. Make sense of that if you can. Once resurrected anew, Griffith formed this new Band of the Falcon, or Band of the Hawk as it's referred to in this manga that I'm reading, composed of humans from both Midland and the Kushan Empire, as well as demons from the Astral World. And so, with this brand new army, he begins his offensive against the Kushan Emperor Ganishka, an incredibly powerful apostle in his own right, one that negates the authority of the God Hand and wants to become a greater being too. It's pretty wild, and man, when these two guys clash, it gets even wilder, in ways never before committed to the pages of this manga. And I'm not just saying that. These chapters made such a huge impression on me, so much so that I would honestly make it comparable to that of the Eclipse during the Golden Age. I don't know if that's a common opinion or not, but it's absolutely how I felt whilst reading it, because... This is it, the culmination of Griffith's pursuit. It feels like the beginning of something entirely and profoundly new. Prophetically, this battle between Ganishka and Griffith ends up becoming the fight that both literally and figuratively sets the foundations for Griffith's rule. On a figurative level, Ganishka presents such a profoundly incomprehensible threat to not just Midland, but the world at large. So much so that any individual that could possibly topple this monster would, no doubt, become a divine figure eligible to rule the world in the eyes of those that witnessed this struggle. And I mean that both in the eyes of man and monster alike. It's a total unification. Poetically and physically, this is the ultimate vision of the kingdom Griffith had. This battle not only is iconic for protecting the world, but also as the first instance for both humans and demons collaborating and helping each other in this effort. This is the eradication of war and the birth of a new era. The transformation Ganishka undergoes is unlike any I've seen in any manga. It's horrifying while also managing to make me feel exceptionally insignificant and small as a reader. The sense of scale Miura manages to capture in these drawings is not only beautiful in a horrific sense, but also vital for this battle's final moments to work effectively. The greater the threat Ganishka can convince us he's capable of, the more incredible the people of Midland and by extension we as an audience feel Griffith's conquest will be. Furthermore, the battle literally sets the foundations for Griffith's rule by physically physically acting as the catalyst that drags the worlds of the astral and mortal realms together in a convincing fashion, creating a kingdom the likes of which only exist in the minds of Griffith and children's storybooks. The result is something so incredibly outlandish and ethereal yet oddly fitting. For a series that has dealt with so much grotesque realism, this is a gorgeous moment of fantasy and respite, a culmination of everything Griffith has ever wanted it seems. And the most impressive thing is, it's all conveyed with no dialogue. This is like attempting a world record and being so confident in your abilities to succeed in that effort that you do it blindfolded. This singular choice set this battle apart from every other clash in the series on a fundamental level for me. It felt as though I was watching one of those intense epic battles on film, like Lord of the Rings at Helm's Deep. With Ganishka's terror and fear of losing to Griffith, with his fear of the invasion he sees, with his fear of the feelings Griffith's presence forces him to feel. It leads him to make the strategic and rash decisions that on the surface made for a tremendously imposing adversary, all the while unconsciously playing right into the hands of prophecy unwittingly. And with Ganishka being one of the few demonic figures that actually pushes against face failing, it makes me wonder how much control, if any, Guts and his party of friends possesses in reality. Skull Knight effectively told Guts that he has to defy destiny, but perhaps his efforts to defy destiny are actually part of a greater plan. And that's what makes this such an incredible story. You have no idea which way it's going to go. Which brings us to our final stop on this long journey. It's time to tackle the unfinished Fantasia arc. Yo! The Boat Adventures. I feel like those that read this release to release might have had a very different experience to share than what I did with this now infamous section. But we'll get to that. After a very dense conclusion courtesy of the previous arc, what with Griffith's final battle with Ganishka, the merging of the both physical and astral worlds, and the resurgence of the City of Falconia, this next boat section is, in a similar way to the Lost Children's Arc of Conviction, quite short and simple. You know, minus the mountain of smoldering child corpses. For the most part, it's presented as a classic high seas adventure, one our heroes need to navigate while being attacked by incredibly dangerous sea creatures and monsters. While there, we get to interact with brand new characters like Isma, who I love, and even more fantastical creatures on the side of light. Hmm, why do I get the feeling Sanji would love it here right now? But all of this in hindsight is minor to me. For unlike Lost Children, which felt like a much needed breather after the eclipse, within this adventure story we get to re-engage with long-running mysteries from the previous stories like one, 
Moon Knight Boy, who I feel at this point must be that weird monster fetus creature Casca was drawn to following the eclipse in the Golden Age arc. Which means this could be the child of both Griffith and Casca, perhaps. Which runs the risk of being one of the most fucked up things this series has done, which is a tall order, but that is neither here nor there, and I hope for the love of God that I'm wrong. In addition to that, we also get a giant monster as the final boss to allow Guts to do what he does best. However, one of the only things I knew about this section before I started reading it was that it was largely hated online. I suspect mostly because it lasted for years of publications during which the Berserk series fell into a long hiatus in addition to Miura at the time releasing about two chapters a year to advance the story. However, personally, Reading it all in one go within about an hour, which I'm sure sounds insane to you that waited over six years to finish this part of the story, I found that I breezed through this little conflict with one of the most goofy villain type concepts we've yet seen committed to the series. However, speaking more precisely about the story at hand, the highlights of the story for me have to be Farnese's continuing of her journey into becoming a powerful magic wielder, focus on the defense of her family unit, and of course, Shooter K's activity as it connects to Guts's once again. One of the longest running tales in this long and winding story is that of how Guts tends to fight, and that's alone. From a young age, he's always been alone, and when he allows himself the chance to connect to other people, the most horrific events befall them all. However, simultaneously, as the world itself grows longer in the tooth, so too do the dangers and responsibilities he's forced to contend with. In many ways, this is a metaphor for life, and in this particular instance, now armed with the Berserker armor, Guts is forced to rely on his allies and friends more than he ever has in the past. He no longer can just fight and slay creatures at will, as time passes on by, his goal of protecting Casca and his friends becomes more than he can handle without the Berserker armor, which itself comes with its own terrible toll in his body, thus creating a necessity for Shirokei's involvement and eventually, unexpectedly, surprising aid of the Moonlight Boy. Spring Flower of Days Long Past Spring Flower of Days Long Ago is a surprisingly short series of chapters that I feel punch way above their weight in terms of emotional resonance and symbolism. Narratively, a surface level reading of the events that take place would tell you that this section serves to inform the readers of Guts' first ever experience with elves through a flashback. Namely, Chich in this instance is the elf. Going one level deeper, there's a consistency being employed here too. We've been told that elves are drawn to honest, wounded humans and so, when we see this little creature look to help Guts in his dying moments, this sequence fits it's that billing. However, all of that aside, what I love about this section isn't any of that really. Instead, it's how beautiful this sequence is both visually and metaphorically. Managing to find the beauty in the most dreary of places, all the while reinforcing to us who Guts is as a character. A moment that tugs on these strings simultaneously has to be that of this scene. During his lowest moment, he notices a flower managing to bloom in his freezing cold cell. And alongside it, he sees with his very own two eyes, a little Elf. Perhaps he can see it because he's destined to be the person he eventually becomes, or perhaps he sees Chich because he's just a kid. A kid that's forced to be more mature and grown up in order to survive. However, with that said, the important part of this little flashback isn't to highlight how Guts tries to be more adult-like, but instead highlights what makes him distinct from everyone else Chich has come across during her time in this cell. And what makes him different isn't his sword, his safety blanket, but a concern he has for another's life, and at great cost to his own, despite what circumstances betrayed his trust and innocence earlier in the story. In other words, this short story proves to us that Guts is foundationally a kind person that would go out of his way to save any life, no matter the cost to his own, which is a far cry from the monster so many think of him as today. The City of Falconia this place is huge, and for the first time in the series, Rickard takes the leading role as the point of view character. Rickard had already been established as an important character way, way before these events, and in both interesting and unfortunate fashion, this is how his story truly begins to unfold. Predominantly, what this section offers is an exploration into Falconia and the picture of Griffith's ambition. Even with his dream having come true in this paradise, we can see some cracks already starting to form through Rickard's choices, Raxas not being 100% loyal to the throne, and a host of secondary threads that come as a result of a certain butterfly effect. Falconia may be a utopia, however, its very existence means that nowhere else can be peaceful and safe. True to Griffith's character, it's either his way or the highway. And there's also this top tier moment where Rickard finally goes from human to apostle by releasing his true form. A man with two gigantic balls as he will smits Griffith in a phenomenal two page spread, spitting straight facts towards the single most powerful entity in this world, Griffith. 
This moment took me completely by surprise, and in that very instance, Rickard, who had already been a brilliant character in my eyes, became one of the most brave in the series. Bullshit. Holy fuck! <laughs> I was not expecting that. Oh my god! <laughs> uh, yes, Rickard. Yes. Oh, that that was so good. Absolute alpha move. Sadly, there are a host of different characters and plot points established in this section that will probably never see a proper resolution. And for that reason, I'll just move on to the final section of the story, and it's my favorite part: the corridor of dreams. This section of the story shows Kentaro Miura and I believe Berserk at their respective peaks. There has never been a single piece of fiction that has affected me quite as much as this has. The profound sense of despair, pain, sadness, hope, and love I felt during my time reading this cannot be compared to anything I've either seen or read in the past. It surpasses quite literally everything. As the previous arc saw the culmination of Griffith's dream, so too does the landing on the shores of Skellig indicate the end of the journey for Guts and the Black Swordsman party. Finally, they have arrived at the Kingdom of Elfhem, where they meet the inhabitants of the Elf Kingdom, elves, witches, and other such magical and fantastical creatures. It's clear that this is the perfect land to develop both Shudake and Farnese, and oh boy, do they develop. But above anything and everything else that this story has dealt with since the Golden Age arc, I've longed for the answer to one question. Can Casca be saved? Has the journey been worth it? Can they bring Casca back? This section, which drives into the subject matter of Casca's retrieval from her subconscious, begins in chapter 347 entitled The Flower Storm Monarch, within which, once again, magic is used to emphasize and facilitate a narrative direction. And right now, I'd like to use this as an opportunity to discuss what I love about magic in storytelling, and indeed Berserk specifically. There's a wonderful video called How to Write Great Magic by a brilliant creator on this platform called The Closer Look. I highly recommend you check out his work and that video. Because in it, it points to the importance of what we value as people. The aspects of great stories that have stood the test of time that stay in our minds. This difference, he hypothesizes, is the root cause for why we remember old stories like that of King Midas. Not for his name, but for the power to turn everything he touches to gold. The lesson or message it wants to communicate. And due to that, more of us likely remember the magic of that story and its subsequent meaning, and less of us will remember the name of that story. And I think that's the reason the most iconic section of this story to this day remains to be the Eclipse Among the Fanbase, and why this magical encounter will be remembered as my favorite moment in the series, and perhaps all of fiction. Partially for how well the magic at hand served the story's overarching message, but also due to how profoundly this story resonated with me personally. I'd consider myself a relatively well-adjusted guy. I have a large circle of truly wonderful friends, I have an amazing partner, and my relationship with my family is solid. But something I have always struggled with is trust. I do not trust easily, and for the majority of my relationships, I found that I truly do not trust those altruistically I have interpersonal relationships with. To this day, I think the amount of people People I truly trust can be counted on a single hand and even then I think I may have a digit or two to spare. And I say that because I feel like the moment that connected with me first in this section wasn't just the incredible journey that follows, but instead Guts's reaction when he heard he couldn't go personally to try and bring Casca back himself. Ever since reaching this land of Elfhem, he's consistently pushed to get Casca to the correct location and into the right hands to begin this process. Guts is a man of action and for him, that's his love language. He's not able to really communicate his feelings in any other way, and so he chooses to do things by action. And so, when he was told he couldn't go and the Farnese and Shirake had to do it in his stead, the conflicted expression that descended across his face was enough to send shivers down my spine. I felt like that was me, and boy did Miura nail it. I've spoken about this plenty of times in this video, the slow progression of Guts from telling himself comforting self-centered lies to someone that has to learn to share the load, the burden, the struggle, with this effectively being his most difficult task thus far, to do nothing but wait. To allow someone else to carry out what is most important to him, and that is the ultimate trust exercise, and much like Guts, this would shatter me. 
and Shatter Me, this absolutely did. In more ways than one. The dreamlike sequence that they have to find their way through is one of the most haunting experiences I've had while reading. The moment of realization I had when I saw that injured hound dragging the casket was enough to reduce me to a sobbing mess. The imagery contained in this section is some of the most difficult for me to journey through. I have so many emotional connections to these characters and to see their pain laid bare like this through soul-destroyingly beautiful imagery is more than enough to place these chapters as the very best or most effective in the series for me. To bring Casca back, Shudike and Farnese have to find the many missing pieces of the broken doll that is Casca's identity. With the journey that they all collectively go on acting as a means of experiencing everything she's felt up until that point, and perhaps most importantly, how she views Guts and, of course, Griffin. Within the fragmented memories of her own unconscious interpretations of Guts, it's a beautiful way to finally understand her true feelings, something that was kept as a mystery for such a long time. Guts is not precisely seen as a white knight, but as this giant black hound, forever there as the watchful protector, wounded and almost helplessly hobbling forward in the hopes that he still might be able to save the only person in the world that he truly loves. Contrasted with this, you'll find her memories of him prior to the eclipse, held in an almost divine regard. The portrayal of their more intimate moments shared, like Campfire Dreams, another one of my favorite chapters, are depicted with astonishing beauty. Griffith's portrayal, on the other hand, is entirely different. Yes, he is seen as the Falcon of Light to the entire world, but here in Casca's dreams, we see the representation of his true nature through the eyes of Casca herself. A giant black specter ready to capture and tear down to pieces everything that stands before him. And it's Guts, her protector and loyal companion, the one that is always there for her that stands up to that imposing adversary. It's incredible. To tie this whole story and Casca's retrieval together in a fashion that truly feels like an end of a long journey, it's Farnese who's the one that puts the final fragment into Casca's broken soul. After experiencing everything Casca has felt to this point, sharing her happy and sad moments, her joys and fears in the most literal of ways, it's Farnese, the one that shared a similar parallel story to Casca, is the one who brings her back from the abyss. Which leads into one of the most beautiful show don't tell panels in the entire manga. Talking to each other in many ways for the very first time, Farnis asks if she remembers Guts, and with the mere pronunciation of his name, without even finishing the sentence, we turn the page and we see Casca's reaction. An entire story between these two characters, a storm of feelings, questions and memories, everything portrayed in one single teary-eyed expressive panel. This, if nothing else, makes Berserk worth it in my book. A mission achieved by the people he needed to trust that could only have been accomplished and completed by those very individuals. Unfortunately, however, moments later, when they move to reunite with each other, the same visual technique is employed to equally catastrophic effect. When Casca is finally reunited with Guts, she doesn't see him, she sees something entirely different. The man she once knew has been scarred by this struggle. Quite literally, he has struggled to hold himself together. He's no longer the man she remembers and what's more, evokes memories from the darkest traumas of her life. The monster Guts had to become in order to survive, in order to protect and create this reality for Casca, is the very aspect of him that terrifies and panics her. Just like the story of King Midas, Guts no longer can have what's most important to him in this world. The ending and final thoughts. At this moment in time, both Guts and Griffith are similar in that they are following their own convictions despite their safe and comfortable circumstances. Griffith wants to seize more control over more land by enacting his will unto those that seek his help, and Guts is faced with a choice. A choice which no doubt would have been answered had the series continued in its current trajectory, I feel. In the most simplistic of ways, Berserk is not only the story of Guts, but more broadly the story of making the right choices for the right reasons. Within the Golden Age, during Campfire of Dreams, Guts reconciles that he might not ever feel a true connection with anyone and, on the back of that sentiment, he decides to embark on a journey of self-discovery, to find his own dream. 
his own conviction, which ultimately leads him to nothing but isolation, an isolation that eventually brings him back to Casca. Similarly, Griffith, during that early portion, chooses to take chance after chance to protect Guts despite it coming at a cost to his dream, which led him to a certain snowy mountaintop, the likes of which led to the single most horrific event in the entire story. An event that threw Guts into a whirlwind rage, the likes of which he hasn't completely surfaced from even after one of my favorite chapters in the entire series, Cracks in the Blade, a chapter that outlines the dangers of this indulgent and selfish quest for revenge, Guts is determined to see through to the bitter end, despite what he stands to lose in the process. But Guts says no to this impulse. He says no to rage, resentment, revenge, and every other aspect of his personal scars Griffith has left him with, because he chooses her. He accepts her as worth it. There's a brief moment in the middle of that intimate chapter between Guts and Casca in the Golden Age that I find fascinating. A moment that Casca is left to make her own decision. In a turn of events that we have not seen much of since then, Guts is entirely vulnerable, with all of his physical and psychological scars laid to bear for her to see plain as day. She sees a dangerous, wounded creature that's been abused their entire life, one that can't bring himself to trust anyone, and yet, in this moment, she accepts him for who he is. She loves him for who he is, and wants to be there for him because of who he is, scars and all. And in a similar way, I think Guts, following this moment in Chapter 364, will have to make a similar choice. One that harkens back to not only the cracks in the blade, but indeed that treasured meeting with Casca. It's no coincidence that Guts got to see Skull Knight's memories while wearing his suit of armor. It's clearly symbolic not only of Guts seeing through the eyes of his confidant, but indeed walking in his boots walking his path. Through these visions, we see a Skull Knight that followed a path of destruction and revenge, one that led him to lose what was most important to him, a revenge that to this day still consumes him entirely. This story, however, is not one that hinges on the decisions of just one individual. In the same way the moon cannot create an eclipse without the sun, Guts' journey of self-discovery cannot exist without Griffith. Neither can exist without the other. One of the final revelations in the story is that of the Moonlight Boy's true identity, that is a substantial part of Griffith's being in the mortal world. Countless times during the Golden Age arc, Griffith is said to be childlike and innocent both in appearance and the aura he exudes. This too is confirmed by the Moonlight Boy during the last few chapters. Apart from a few obvious and more grotesque implications that this might imply, I genuinely believe that this is a visual representation or manifestation for the conflict in Griffith's mind. The same conflict which prevented him from taking the optimal path towards his dreams early on in the Golden Age, one that took chances to protect Guts at all costs. Much like those that we saw on the beach and the pirate sections of this very story too. The final revelation by Miura, while I can see why it upsets some people for leaving us on the largest cliffhanger in the series, I will also say that I think it's an incredible moment for the series to end with. Boasting the look of Casca and Guts's dark features under the full moon's light and the soft and fair features of Griffith beneath the sun, this instance is a physical manifestation of the very moment that has defined this entire series the eclipse, a coming together of both light and dark to create something entirely new. And so now, can Tara Miura and the team behind this breathtaking story ask us, the audience, one final question? What path does the man who we know is naturally kind but filled with a nurtured rage follow? What path does the man who's naturally rageful but nurtured to be kind follow? Can Guts accept that what's done is done and live out the rest of his life in peace as the dutiful protector and companion to Casca? Or does he embrace the rageful hound that lurks right beneath the surface? Can Griffith live out his dream while ignoring what's undeniably important to him? In the process, Guts. In the end, the Zerk asks us to ask ourselves, who are we really? and is lying to ourselves worth it or a comfortable fantasy. Kentaro Miura was fired for being too good. That's a common line you hear from anyone who talks about him and his work. And honestly, it takes an honest author and former employer like George Morikawa, the creator of Hajime no Ippo, to admit something like that. What would have happened if Miura kept working as an assistant and never came out as a solo artist? Reading interviews from different colleagues and friends who knew him, it's clear how much he influenced everyone around him in a positive way, and how big the mark he left as a mangaka truly is. Now, if you got to this point in the video, there's likely no need to explain to you why or to stress how important Berserk truly is. Not only to the world of manga, but to media and storytelling in general. Just how much would be lost to us if Miura never met someone that encouraged him to not work as an assistant and to just go for it. 
What would have happened if he never tried and never became the obsessive, perfection-seeking author he would later become known as around the world? Osamu Tetsuka, or as some might remember him as the godfather of manga, was constantly asked questions like, Why do you work like this? Why would anyone do something like this to themselves? Why do you do what you do if you know how crazy it is? And to that, he would lose himself for a second, staring vacantly at something only he could understand, breaking only to respond with a smiling, hmm, I wonder why. How passionate an artist is, is something only they can understand. And maybe there are no real motives to do what they do. Maybe they just do it because that's the only way they know how to live. He died doing what he wanted, no matter what, right? I bet he died happy. Kintaro Miura chose to dedicate his entire life to his work. And even with the help of Studio Gaga, the team he would later allow to help him with the serialization of Berserk, he would become more and more obsessive with putting out his best efforts into his manga. This work was his life. And even if he'll never know how positively Berserk's impact has affected people around the world, I hope he felt proud about what he achieved. Proud of the first step he took in the 80s when he was first fired and became a solo author. A perfectionist will never be satisfied but I hope that he never finished drawing a single page or panel with any sense of regret, simply because he gave it his all. Rest in peace, and thank you, Kentaro Miura. In this world, there is a chance of a human being. There is a human a 自らの一切自由にはできない。人は記憶の彼方。遥か遠い日。心に負った小さな傷をかばうために剣を取る。人は思いの彼方。遥か遠い日。微笑みながら行くために剣を振る。